Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Boston School Committee. I'm Chairperson Jerry Robinson. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll ask my colleagues to please unmute and join me. I pledge allegiance the flag. to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, of States of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it, stands, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice. And justice. Because this is a remote meeting, I will ask Ms. Sullivan to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Blanco Garcia? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. At this time, I would like to entertain a motion for the school committee to adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Boston School Police Supporter Officers Federation and the Lunch Hour Monitors Association. To have this discussion in an open meeting could have a negative impact on the committee's bargaining strategy. The committee will return to public session at 6 p.m. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Sullivan. At this time, I'll ask my fellow members the superintendent and staff to log off from this public session and join the executive session using the Zoom link sent out by Ms. Sullivan. We'll see you in a moment. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. and Welcome to this meeting of the Boston School Committee. I'm Chairperson Jerry Robinson. The committee just returned from an executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Boston School Police Supporter Office, Superior Officers Federation and the Lunch Hour Monitors Association. To have this discussion in an open meeting could have, had, could have a negative impact on the committee's bargaining strategy. Tonight's session is being shared live on Zoom. It will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the school committee's webpage and on YouTube. The recording will be available in all of the BPS languages. Tonight's meeting documents are posted on the committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org slash school committee under the March 22nd meeting link. The meeting documents have been translated into all of the major BPS languages. Any translations that are not ready prior to the start of the meeting will be posted as soon as they are finalized. The committee is pleased to offer live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verriano, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and American Sign Language. The interpretation <coughs> feature has been activated. Click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to select your language preference. I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Thank you everyone who signed up for public comment. Sign up for public comment closed today at 4.30. Please make sure that you are signed into Zoom under the same name you used to sign up for public comment. You can use the Zoom tools to rename yourself so that committee staff will be able to recognize you when it comes time to call on you. Thank you for your cooperation. We will begin with the approval of minutes. At this time, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the March 15th, 2023 budget hearing and school committee meeting as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objections to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? I don't know what I'm voting on, so I guess I have stayed. Oh, 
Sure. It's it's the minutes to the March 15th meeting. Perfect. Uh, yes. Thank you. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to the superintendent's <clears throat> report. I present to you our superintendent, Mary Skipper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to everyone. You know, even though we're only in March, um, we're already beginning to think about and planning for next school year. And I'm happy to share with everyone our BPS 2023-2024 calendar. We finalized the dates for all of our August training meetings, which is always a, just an exciting time as we think about the new year. Um, and also the dates with the beginning of school, which will start on September 7th, 2023. The calendar will be posted on our website. And as we think about ending this school year, we're also preparing for our fifth quarter, which is our summer programming. Um, and so I'll be giving uh, quite an update on this uh, tonight. Um, first of all, I'm thrilled to share with all of you that we officially opened registration for the fifth quarter summer programs today. As you may know, the fifth quarter summer learning programs are five weeks and they're full day elective programs for students, some of which take place at our schools and others are run by community-based organizations, either at a school or at a community location. Our goal this summer is to deliver not just more seats for students, but also to expand our partners, our locations and our opportunities. Most of all, to make sure it's fun for our students. Our pro programs are designed to build knowledge, expose our kids to new opportunities, and most importantly, increase the joy factor that we all have during summer when the sun is out and um, we have less responsibility. As always, our fifth quarter accepts students of all abilities, including students with IEPs. Registration is open to all students with disabilities, and these are one of our priority groups, along with our um, economically disadvantaged, our multilingual learners, and our HERN homeless students. We're also piloting more inclusion in the fifth quarter programs, building off of last year's success, where we integrated many ELL learners to these programs. We'll be expanding inclusion to include more program offerings, that can meet the needs of our students with a wider range of abilities, including again, our students uh, who are on IEP or with disabilities. Um, and this is really a, a priority for us. One of the things that um, I saw when I came on as superintendent was that we had more limiting offers for our multilingual learners and for our special education students. And so I gave a commitment that um, in this upcoming fifth quarter, we would make sure that we prioritize these groups of students and we made sure that we had a more inclusive setting. So I'm excited about this piece for our summer, for our families and our students. And I'm really looking forward to being able to see our inclusive environments in operation. Uh, of course, these expanded opportunities that we're talking about for uh, students with disabilities is also in addition to our more traditional what we call ESY or extended school year programming. Um, and this, this is really programming uh, for our students with disabilities who require especially designed instruction or related services um, in terms of learning time. We will offer 1300 seats in the fifth quarter for inclusive opportunities for students with disabilities, 1300. BPS will offer academic, and related services during the fifth quarter for students attending these programs to provide a continuum of options for students with disabilities throughout the summer. Our projection currently is to provide um, our multilingual learners with ELD levels of one to five um, to be approximately 40%. And so that's about um, 6,800 students who will be from the multilingual learner population. And so that's 40, that's 6,800 of the overall 17,000 students that we expect to enroll for summer programming. We anticipate that the enrollment 
of multilingual learners for the fifth quarter programming will be proportionate to the overall number of multilingual learners enrolled in the district. So these are the ways in which we're really trying to look at summer and to make sure year round that all of our students have um, equitable access to what's being offered. Of course, um, we partner with Boston After School and Beyond to strengthen and expand on our partnership portfolio for summer programs, both in and out of BPS sites. For example, Hill Reservation and Courageous Sailing, they've been longstanding partners and they hold their programs offsite. This summer, we've also added World Ocean, League Grow Programs and Dream Catchers. And we will continue to try to expand our menu more broadly of other community partners to join into that menu. Our students, whether they are coming into our buildings or they're attending a partner site, will be choosing experiences that they're interested in. Some will sail, some will make films, others will explore STEM, or some may deepen their writing or consider career paths and explore. Others will bolster math and reading skills through project-based learning. And of course, the hallmark of good summer program is doing lots of field trips and getting the students out into the community. To do all of this, we are increasing fifth quarter by 25%, 25%, offering 127 programs in a combination of schools, in community-based settings. We're welcoming 12 new community partners, in addition to the ones that I included, Fresh Film and Springboard will also be included in our menu. These programs will be able to serve roughly 9,000 students, which is an increase last year from just under 7,100 students. Um, so we really believe this summer is important. Um, it's important to for our parents, um, and our families to take note of the offerings. I'll talk in a minute about how we're communicating it out, um, but this is really an opportunity to see the summer as that fifth quarter um, and to continue to engage our young people and to give them supports. Fifth quarter is joined by a menu of other summer programming too. As usual, we'll be offering the extended school year ESY for students whose IEP calls for additional time and high school credit recovery, among others. We've aligned schedules, so all programs will run across the same five weeks from July 10th until August 11th, better serving family needs. And that's from feedback from families. In total, our learning programs will be able to serve, again, our goal, more than 17,000 students. All summer learning programs will continue to provide meals and in our six larger school sites, where there's multiple programs in those facilities, um, you will also have hub stop transportation. So the sites that um, these hub sites are spread across uh, the city. We have Blackstone, BLS, Charlestown High School, Mattahunt, Mildred Ave, and Orchard Gardens. And last year, actually, one of my first things that I got to do um, was to actually um, go to Orchard Gardens and be able to see all of the summer programming um, and, and meet some of the parents. And it was, um, and see what uh, after school, Boston After School and Beyond was doing. And I can say it was such a wonderful entry into the, into the district early, but wonderful. Um, of course, I can't talk about summer opportunities without talking about summer jobs for youth in partnership with the mayor's office, private industry council, ABCD and other key partners, we aim to connect a record number, nearly 3,000 youth with summer jobs and internships. Uh, I've always thought about summer as a unique opportunity for our students, a different time and way to learn, to explore, to develop um, that's not always possible in the traditional school year. Our summer budget and programming present a huge investment roughly $17 million in our students for the fifth quarter and the summer programming. Um, and, and this matters. You know, we know, we know that uh, research by, by RAND Corporation backs it up that 
up to two thirds of the achievement gap um, between low income students and their higher income peers is connected to unequal access to high quality summer learning opportunities. This research further informs us that students who attend summer learning programs at least 80% of the time, they see the strongest outcomes upon return. So it's on us not just to offer and, and develop the offerings and opportunities, but to really ensure that what we're offering is engaging for our students, it's productive, most important, it's fun and enjoyable because it is the summer months. This really matters, you know, getting feedback from students from the year, the summer before about what they enjoyed. And that means that they will return if they had a good experience. You know, our kids really get to kind of see, you know, get to, to feel what it's like during this time as they go out and they do field trips or they participate um, in the various aspects of the programs. And they get to put on and to feel what it would be like to be an engineer or to be a scientist or a writer or a filmmaker or a poet or a dancer. I mean, there's just so many different opportunities for students to explore and discover more about what they enjoy. Building programs is only half of it. While the five week learning programs will all officially kick off July 10th, families can start registering for opportunities right now, today, which is the earliest we've ever opened registration. And our goal going forward is to be able to do this earlier and earlier, understanding that families want to know students are going to be settled and have a, a summer program um, well in advance. Families can visit our BPS website, bostonpublicschools.org forward slash summer. On this page, families can learn more about all of the programs, as well as research the external programs offered in and around Boston. We've made, we've made the registration for fifth quarter programs easier than ever. It has a more user-friendly platform available in nine languages, but families don't have to do this by themselves. The summer team has done great work um, under Chief Snyder and Deputy Tavares to train family liaisons, to train our hub school coordinators and several partners to help our families with registration. Over the coming weeks, you'll see our billboards and you'll find our fifth quarter teams at registration pop-ups at community events, such as the Kite Festival in Franklin Park, Wake Up the Earth in Jamaica Plain, Family STEM Day at DSNI, Grove Hall Library, East Boston Library, Harvard Kent Housing Development, and many more. Our summer jobs crew will also be visible helping to sign up youth for jobs with the Private Industry Council, ABCD, and the Mayor's Success Link Program. They'll be hosting information sessions and stations and job fairs in high schools, sharing flyers with schools to share with students and families, and working with our school liaisons, social workers, and guidance counselors to really get the word out and help students complete the applications for those uh, opportunities and jobs. We're looking forward to a really fun and productive summer of learning and growing. Please visit our website, again, bostonpublicschools.org forward slash summer to learn more and to sign up today. I'm gonna switch for a minute to one of my favorite things, which is the bright spots part of the report. Uh, big congratulations to Isabella Kim, a student at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, who received the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESE, Massachusetts Student Achievement Award. Commissioner Riley wrote Isabella expressing his pride in her work, and we want Isabella to know that we are proud of her as well. Also, congratulations is in order for Winship Elementary's Tenoshi in Omata, who won the spelling bee over the weekend, he will move on to compete in the nationals. And this weekend at the Boston Arts Academy, there was a performance of Shrek the Musical. They had the whole audience on their feet, including Chairperson Robinson, Mayor Wu and her two sons, and everyone loved and applauded the show. And finally, 
ESL students from the Boston Adult Technical Academy, which we call BATA, showcased their work in an exhibit held at the Revolution Hotel. The project is a creative exploration of the themes of identity and home. Their students hail from all across the world and what's important to them. The I Am Project asked students to use written and visual arts by creating self-portraits and poetry to explore and convey the essential components that make up their identity and their sense of home and belonging. So I know we have um, a lot of votes ahead of us and much discussion, so I will close. Um, and I will certainly consider uh, questions and, and comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and discussion. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Gracias, Madam Chair. Gracias, Superintendente, por el reporte. Eh, me emociona mucho que nuestros estudiantes con discapacidad puedan tener la oportunidad de ir a un programa de verano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Superintendent. It really gets me excited to know that the children with disabilities will be able to join the summer camps. Me encanta porque ha sido un pedido por mucho tiempo de los padres poder ver a sus hijos en un programa de verano. I love it because the parents have requested this for so long to be able to see their children participate in, in the summer camp. Pienso que podemos seguir teniendo conversaciones para que no solo sea en el verano que ellos tengan programas, sino que también puedan tener programas después de la escuela. I think we can continue having conversations so they can not only participate in summer camp, but also to have programs after school. Porque muchos padres están, preguntan, envían cartas, ¿cuándo van a tener un programa de, de after school para nuestros niños? Y, y, y no, no ha sido fácil tenerlos. Because a lot of parents ask, they send letters, they want to know when they're going to have programs for their children with disabilities. En ese sentido, me gustaría saber más. Es importante que los padres, tomando en cuenta que ya desde mañana van a poder inscribirse, es importante saber dónde está la qué población, cuáles son los, los lugares donde se van a estar ofreciendo. And I think it's important to know since uh, they can enroll their children uh, from tomorrow on the locations of the summer camps where they can enroll their children. Uh, through you, Chair. Okay, okay, uh, Ms. Polanco, yeah. to go? Okay, Sorry? Yeah. Okay, to answer? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so through you, Chair. So, um, I'm going to actually, uh, Dr. Tavares is on. I, I want to be able to show you the team, and I believe Jillian and Alba are here as well. Um, and, and these, are, this is the team that's been putting together with Chief Snyder um, a lot of the work on the fifth quarter, um, and given some thought with both at the academic side of the house with Dr. Chen, uh, but also uh, with family equity, family and community engagement, uh, where programming for our multilingual students and where they can gain access. So I'm going to, um, if you guys can turn your cameras on so everyone can see. And uh, Dr. Devaris, I don't know if you want to. Um, just be able to clarify for our multilingual learners um, how specifically when they're registering, uh, will they know where the programs are? Absolutely. Um, muchísimas gracias, licenciada Polanco Garcia, for those wonderful comments and um, for uplifting, you know, the efforts of this incredible team and under the guidance and leadership of Superintendent Skipper for us to be able to say with much um, joy and pride that we have open programs for our students with multiple abilities is very exciting to us too. 
And, um, you know, more specifically for our multilingual learners, we have staff that are absolutely at hand to also support them. And um, one little, um, you know, the superintendent's uh, report was really large, and I wanted to share just one small example. And then I want to ask our executive director, um, Cruz Davis, and of course, Jillian Nescos, who's also part of the team to share a little bit more. One of the programs that's really exciting is actually happening for STEM in um, in the uh, with one of our partners, and that particular program that's happening with STEM and, and really in collaboration with the academics team is going to have the opportunity for students, like I said, with multiple abilities and multiple languages. And um, in particular, they're welcoming students um, who happen to also have autism. And um, that's very, very exciting to us because it's going to be an opportunity for students of all abilities to be together and to be able to really participate in that five week program and delve into STEM and some arts as well. So I just wanted to share a little bit more about um, some of the programs in a more specific uh, way. And then I invite um, Executive Director um, Alba Cruz Davis to share a little bit more too. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Torres. Hola, como esta, licenciado Polanco Garcia. I um, wanted to share with you how excited we are to be able to offer for our extended school year program um, different locations across the city. It's actually 13 different locations across the city. And we're thrilled to announce that we're collaborating with various community-based organizations this year to provide our ESY students with an enriching summer program. And some of our partners and organizations include Joe's Crazy Critters, the Community Music Center of Boston, the Boston Ballet, and the Youth Enrichment Group. With their help, we will offer a range of activities, such as group music therapy sessions, adaptive dance classes, art classes, fitness classes, and potentially classes in the performance arts. Additionally, we're excited to plan field trips for our students, enabling them to explore the community and enjoy a fun-filled summer outside the classroom. So those are just some examples of the enrichment um, opportunities that we're offering. That's great. Alba, can you just, um, can you just give uh, the committee a sense in the public when a parent is registering and say they have a student with autism, um, how will they know from the programs and the program selections what uh, would be appropriate to choose? Yes. So. Um, there are the 1300 students, which you um, discussed earlier, Superintendent Skipper, yes. that, that are eligible to be in this pilot inclusion, if you would. So those, um, those students will be high priority, as well as our economically disadvantaged English language learners or multilingual learners, and um, HERN, or our homeless education research network students. So because their ID, their BPS ID is linked, we will be able to identify what students are eligible. And Superintendent Skipper, if I could just add, as a parent who uses this program, because I'm a proud BPS parent myself, following the ID number as um, uh, Director Cruz Davis has shared. It also is an opportunity when you're registering in the platform, you're also able to indicate if any special programs are needed. So as a parent, I'm able to follow it. It's, it's we hope families feel like it's much more user-friendly this year and we're using Schoolment, so we're using a platform that's very um, public friendly. And in that way, parents will be able to be very specific around the specific supports that their child needs. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Muchas gracias. Solamente un seguimiento, una última pregunta. ¿Le van a ofrecer transportación a estas familias? Sí. Yes. All Definitivamente. Right. For, for just to answer the question with regards to transportation. So any child that receives door-to-door -door transportation during the school year will receive door-to-door -door transportation during summer. That's great. 
Others? Mr. Cardet Hernandez? Thank you so much for the update. I want to echo um, everything uh, Ms. Palonco Garcia said as well. Um, I won't use more time to to say anything more, but it is incredibly exciting and I love to see uh, uh, disabled students uh, getting a, a better chance at having a seat at the table uh, in the programming. I'm glad to see it's your priority too. I do have a question. It wasn't in your report, but um, hopefully I can ask about it now. I think, you know, we've been getting or I've been getting letters about this issue. Um, and then we've also probably read about it in the press locally and, and a little bit nationally as well. But it's the youth risk behavior survey that went out to middle school students. Um, there were a lot of concerns, it seems, from families around the information that they had about the survey. Uh, before it was administered to students, the questions that were being asked specifically around uh, sexual behaviors and practices, and then also the sort of like postmortem, like how was it then discussed? Um, I left with all of those same questions. So I'm just sort of curious to hear your framework. Uh, were th was there a mistake? Did we, are we gonna do something different in the future? And then I guess also this data has never been brought here and it wasn't even, it hasn't been included in our budget conversations about how we deploy resources. So I'm just sort of curious, what is the data for? Um, and when we issued this survey, like would we do anything different in the future given the concerns that were raised? Sure, so I'll, I'll do my best to get all of those. So the Youth Risk um, Behavior Survey is a survey that's given nationally and then through the states. Um, it is, it's a health survey that tries to look at um, youth activity uh, on a variety of levels. And the questions change uh, to some extent year to year, um, but then uh, there's lots of questions that stay sort of stable um, in the administration. Uh, we have participated, my understanding in BPS for 30 years uh, doing the survey. Um, I know when I was a principal, it was administered, you know, we gave it. Um, and you know, we, it's given at certain grade levels, it's given um, what kind of a selection of classrooms. Uh, so not every student takes it at every time, but it's meant to try to get kind of an average feeling um, of what the behaviors are. And then to be able to use that data um, in student support in our health curriculum uh, to, to sort of guide and be able to kind of shift if we're seeing uh, risky behavior in particular areas emerge. Um, the my understanding of this year's survey uh, was that it was identical to last year's survey uh, in terms of the questions. And I think some of the questions in the sexual behavior part were actually pretty consistent with past years, even beyond that. Um, the uh, it usually surveys um, students and uh, usually surveys students in areas such as um, alcohol, substance use, um, social media behaviors, um, uh, physical violence um, and dating, uh, sexual activity, um, just to name a few. Um, my understanding is that there, there were some parents who um, were concerned about the wording of some of the questions. Um, and so that is something that we're, uh, we're taking back as feedback. There is a committee which com consists of uh, some BPS health uh, curriculum folks, um, as well as uh, people from the health commission uh, and local hospitals, doctors, um, who serve on that committee who screen the questions. Um, so they see the wording, they see the content of the questions, and then for every question to be approved um, for inclusion in the survey in the optional section for us, that committee looks at it. Um, so that was no different than it's been in past years. But again, anytime parents are giving us feedback, we're going to take that feedback, um, you know, back to that to that advisory committee and share that with them, um, so that we can figure out um, what and how we might be able to word the questions differently, um, and yet still get information that could be actionable. So that process is sort of underway now that we've gotten some feedback. Um, I think the other issue was that when parents went, when a group of parents went to look at the survey. Uh, link. I believe that for a short time the link was broken, and they had to. It was. It was just. It was accidental, and the link was broken, and so they they immediately fixed it. 
Um, but I think there was that delay in them going and kind of looking at the questions. Uh, but nonetheless, they've given feedback since then. And I do believe that um, our, uh, there's a group of um, our folks who are meeting um, with some parents who have expressed concerns to get that feedback and to determine um, how we will use that feedback with the committee, with the advisory committee for the questions. Um, and then I think they had some other um, feedback around the administration and how better to communicate with parents about the intent of the survey and the types of questions that students might see. And do families get a choice? Thank you for that. Do families get a choice to opt out? Because I th I can imagine they that do. That they do get a choice to opt out. But I think, you know, it's like anything else. Parents are busy um, and they may or may not read things, um, you know, it, it, or like think about like what the survey actually is. And so this was, I think, the point that some of the parents were making, like, because it is something important, particularly with, you know, students who might be in younger grades, um, it would be really good if we could find additional ways to communicate to our families what the survey is and, you know, how, in fact, they can, um, you know, why they might want to opt out if they do. Yeah. Um, so those will all be, you know, again, anytime parents are giving us feedback, we're going to take it. Um, and so that will be an ongoing dialogue as we think about the administration. In terms of the incorporation of the survey feedback, um, what I will say is that um, I have always um, done an explicit presentation to school committee on the survey results. I, I find them actually some of the most important results we see as a district. Um, and they're very, and I'm, in my mind, very actionable. And I think post pandemic, we are definitely seeing um, in, in the recent release, some different kinds of trends with the students that I think we have to think about how as a district to adjust to. And this can be everything from substance use, um, the type of substance that students have um, to feel LGBTQIA and, um, you know, in, in, uh, and most importantly, having just come back from the Council of Great City Schools uh, conference and um, had an update, a national update uh, on the youth risk behavior survey from a national lens, the area that was of most concern to everyone was the mental health issues that our students are facing. Um, uh, just to give you a sense, the national data spoke to almost one out of three young women, um, 18 and under, um, 18 into the um, middle school ages, uh, having, having active thought of uh, suicide and self-harm. Um, with, um, you know, about 13% actually acting on that um, or attempting to. And I think we're just seeing upticks in the area of mental health, of depression, anxiety, um, you know, again, um, thought of suicide or acts, uh, you know, intentional acts of self-harm, cutting behaviors, um, all which speak to the continued need for us to invest in mental health for students. Um, and I think there's an important dialogue there to be had with our parents about what parents can look for and see. Um, and if they do see some of those things to make sure that they work with the schools in partnership um, in getting support for, for their students. So um, you will generally, I tie this to um, uh, when health presents as part of the curriculum. Here, we may wanna do it um, you know, uh, early spring relative to student support as well, because I think the action piece isn't just on the curriculum side, it's also in um, the SEL that we provide our students that's embedded. And then certainly on the student support side, it's the active support that we're giving from our social workers uh, through to the rest of our infrastructure. Perfect. Um, some of the feedback that we, that at least was emailed to me was around, instead of an opt out, like giving families more options to opt in. Um, and so, I'm not sure where that's landing now. I think particularly for some of the younger families, because the particularly the questions around sexual activity felt explicit. And, <laughs> you know, I was a middle school and high school principal. Like, you know, it's a fascinating time in a young person's life. You have yeah. sixth graders who are having those conversations and you have sixth graders who are playing with GI Joes in the bathtub. And so, you know, it's yeah. a very, the, the young folks are really different and at different places during that time. And I think a lot of the concern was families being like, my kid's not ready for that conversation. And I know they're not ready. And I want to be able to tell you if they are. Yeah, I think we'll definitely take the feedback. I think one of the challenges that we we always have is that if we do an opt-in, an opt um, 
that the the labor of the opt-in and the reality that many parents won't read or respond to email to opt-in, even though they have no issue with the student taking the survey, that we then get very skewed results because we have fewer and fewer students taking it. And again, I can't emphasize enough that this is really critical information that we get to be able to see the trends that are sort of happening across our youth and how best to respond to it. Um, this is something that all cities you know, participate in. It's something that is given nationally. Um, it really is considered, I mean, such was at the Council of Bay City Schools, they took an entire session to talk about it. Um, so we wanna make sure that our numbers are you know, as robust as possible. That said, I think we wanna take the feedback and then certainly talk with the professionals um, you know, within health and um, you know, certainly with the health commission see if there might be some things that we can do to strike some balance. And then last question here, do we, did we add questions to the survey? Cause that seems to be- So there's optional, um, uh, districts are allowed to add optional questions. Those questions are generated out of the CDC. Um, and then those questions are reviewed by that health commission that I spoke about, um, that advisory commission. Um, and then from that, there's questions that, uh, that are generally added. Sometimes they're added in because you see a trend, um, you know, in the years before, and you want to go a little deeper, or you don't see anything, um, and it's an area that you haven't really um, done much surveying on, and so you want to at least ask a couple of questions on that area. Um, so I think it varies what the optional questions are. In our case, the couple of questions that were at um, in question were part of the last few, sur like the last surveys. So that was not something recently added. Those were something that had been um, surveyed on prior in the in the past years. Great. Last thing, and then I will end my time. The I do think for whatever it's worth, however this continues, like if my, I would be anxious about my own child taking that survey in sixth grade had mm -hmm. I not had clarity around better clarity than what was communicated like you just mm -hmm. you know, just keeping it real around what it was but also like what I do as a parent afterwards like what's the at-home conversation yeah. that night what's the reminder that is bumped up to me not through a robocall but like here's some questions to ask your kid after they take the survey and I suspect that level of touch is missing on such a sensitive topic, particularly around suicidal ideation, multiple sexual partners, rape, drug use, like really meaty stuff in a single session that like part of what I'm sure creates anxiety is like my kids coming home and telling me and I don't yeah. have any tools to engage and the system hasn't offered me any, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's um it's a good point. One of the things I've actually been talking to Chief Kelton about in the student support side is organizing um, with our social workers to have sort of kind of monthly seminar um, on a variety of different risk topics that I think would be helpful for parents to hear. You know what is what's happening, what does data say is happening, um, how best to to talk about the you know or have a conversation. Um, you know, what are, you know, signs of, or concerns, um, you know, that you might, um, you might notice that's going on, like with behavioral pattern with, with your student. Um, I think, you know, there's a whole parent education in general right now. And I think, you know, one of the things I've been saying is I think social media has aged our children. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, their access to things that are way beyond um, their years in many ways. Um, because very unrestricted on social media. And so if your students are using their phone unsupervised, which most do, um, and if they have a phone, if they're on social media, if they're using a friend's phone um, or they have access to a, a, a computer at a friend's house, um, they're likely seeing things. Um, and you know, this is where it's important that they're hearing accurate information, um, not you know warped information or, um, worse yet, uh, you know, misinformation. So I, you know, I think that this is, this is all, I think very much emerging from the age of social media and pandemic, um, you know, clearly with the pandemic, students begin living in a very different virtual world. And so, uh, you know, we're just seeing behaviors on social media that we would typically see with middle schoolers, say seventh and eighth grade, that we're seeing as young as third and fourth grade. Um, and, you know, and sometimes parents aren't aware um, because students are very good, right? As, as we all were when we were that age um, of keeping what we want to keep private. Mm -hmm. And so it is, um, you know, it's just really, I think, critical that 
the parents and our educators and district all work together on this to keep our young people safe. Absolutely. We're talking about it honestly, openly, frequently. And I agree with you. It's like it's social media and it's also just like the increased access to pornography. And so correct. Like correct. all of it together. It's like their friends yeah. channel, but also just the 24 seven access to really right. violent images of sex and sexuality. So I'm with you. Thank you for clarifying. And I hope we can keep You're welcome. Uh, sort of deepening this conversation with families so that they feel Absolutely. Like they too. Thank you. Dr. Alkins. Um, yes, I actually had two questions, one related to the previous conversation we were having just about um, summer programming and us actually seeing data around what has the access looked like over perhaps a five-year period. Are we actually seeing more groups from underrepresented uh, populations engaging in summer program effectively, or is it sort of just sort of a leveling that we've that we've seen? And some of that might just also be related to, you know, students leaving the district or like wh whatever, not accessing summer programs because they're not in the district. Um, that's my first question. My my second question is sort of related to the most recent conversation of. At what stage across the district are students engaging in health education? Yeah. Um, be, because I, I mean, I understand the purpose of the survey is to help improve health education, but if our students are not actually undergoing it, then it's it it's weird to ask them to sort of contribute to it. It's it's just a I don't know, just asking. Yeah, no, no, it's a, a good question. Um, so in terms of the first one, I'm going to actually ask um, Dr. Tavares, it may be um, Alba or Jillian are best positioned to answer that um, from the past data in terms of who's participating and taking advantage. Thank you, Superintendent. I'm actually going to ask the team to also um, show on camera because Dr. Alkins, they have been uh, maintaining some data. And I'm going to ask uh, Director Cruz Davis to please respond. Um, she can give you some of the specific data of, of the populations that have been accessing the summer programming. Um, I have a percentage points, but I know Alba can go into it a little deeper. 38% um, of the students are self-identify, family self-identify as Black, and 42% identify as Latinx. Um, so that gives you a bit of a picture and then Alba will give you a bit more detail. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alkins, for the question. Um, so in terms of trends over time, to your point, yes, we have been able to engage more families or more students of color. And as um, Dr. Tavares pointed out, the last year that we have reporting for, which is 2022, um, the majority were Latinx, again, at 42% followed by Blacks at 38%, um, and then White and Asian and other. Um, there's also been an increase in our EL students, and as well as an increase in students that have transitioned from EL to general population. And um, as D Superintendent Skipper pointed out, an increase in um, children with um, dis students with disabilities um, and um, as you know, and we pointed out, we're hoping to engage more now that we're offering more inclusive programs. Um, we can give you uh, more of a summary in terms of the past five years, it, but you, um, if, you, if you could give us um, at least until tomorrow to do that, that would be. Yeah, like absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad to check in on that. Okay, but thank you for the question. And I think, um, I think on the other one, I actually want Jill Carter to speak to it, um, but she's in transition right now in the car. Um, so Dr. Alcons, we'll come back to that question and I'll, I'll get you the answer during it because it has to do with scope and sequence. So it's different things are offered at different grades. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I really appreciate the conversation so far. So um, Superintendent, I echo my fellow members' comments about the summer programming. I'm excited that you appear to be out earlier and wider. 
particularly for our students with disabilities. Really appreciate the outreach on that and the transportation that you addressed about them. Um, my concern, my quite it's not a concern, it's a question. You mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you're opening up the enrollment for it now. What are we doing to communicate on that, particularly outreach? Mm -hmm. I always get nervous when it's, you know, kind of first come, first serve, so to speak. Or the early bird gets the worm, you fill in any analogy that you want. I want to make sure we're doing outreach and particularly to communities that maybe, you know, don't even think of it because in the past we didn't provide transportation or we didn't provide access, that type of thing. So how, what are we going to do since we have different program and different access this year for students that have traditionally not been served by these programs? What are we going to do to particularly reach out to those communities? Right. So I think, um, and I'll have the team chime in, but um, in general, I think, you know, part of the network structure and having family engagement um, in each of the schools, family uh, engagement specialists in each of the schools, we definitely uh, have, have worked with them um, for a deeper understanding of what's being offered during the summer and how um, families can get access and to register. So they're um, poised, you know, in a way that last year, I think that we were just sort of queuing it up. Um, they're poised this year to be able to uh, support that. I also think the push out relative to the website, much more, you know, user friendly, um, going with School Mint, you know, we just, we were, one of the pieces of feedback we got was it was just too complex um, for families who are attempting to do it on their own. Um, so really trying to take that barrier away um, with School Mint and have it be more customized um, for the parent in that experience. Also all the different languages that I shared earlier. Um, and then I think this idea of the pop-ups, right? Which we know works with our students wonderfully. Um, and that is bringing it to them. So, you know, whether it's at festivals that might be happening, um, whether it's at the, you know, in the hub schools, whether it's ha happening, something happening in the hub center or the community school center, um, we can do a pop-up there. I think the libraries are another area that we're, we're gonna work toward. Um, the housing developments, another area, really try to meet parents where they are. Um, you know, I imagine the faith-based community we are doing, um, we'll be doing outreach with because that's another source to be able to get um, information to our parents for attending services. So we're really trying to be as push out um, as we can, as well as make sure that the facing in of the website uh, is as friendly as possible. Okay. And certainly- And, and I um, hope you're, you're including also like SpedPAC and the school site council. Oh yes, all of the all of our major parent, parent advocacy groups who do such a tremendous job for us um, right. in getting the work out, they'll, they'll all be included as well. Um, and Dr. Tavares, anything I, I left out that you wanna remark on? Superintendent, the only thing I would add, um, and I'm so happy that you mentioned the regional structure, are the family liaisons. So the family liaisons play a critical role in really sharing specifics around the programming for students in the fifth quarter. And, um, uh, you know, Mr. O'Neill, I will say that don't worry about the, the early bird getting the worm, because we, we're hoping that that's not the way it, it's like you're in and anybody else who registers after you is not is actually not the way that the registration works. And I'm actually going to invite uh, Miss Nesco's because she's the one that really knows the details about registration to just say a couple of words about that as well. Jillian, could you share a little bit more about registration? Or maybe not. Maybe I'll share about it. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Technology is so fun of when course. we're not in the same room. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure happens is this connection with the regional, you know, the regional model that the superintendent emphasizes, and also thinking about public libraries and spaces where our families convene. Um, and the pop-ups that the superintendent mentioned is, are going to be really critical, especially specifically in the languages of our communities. So that's something that can't be emphasized enough. You know, the superintendent mentions it often, but I feel like sometimes we forget the importance of being able to make sure that families can access the information in their languages is really actually a critical component to this. And then at the school level, making sure that all of the staff at the school level that are public facing and that are really supporting families are really knowledgeable about what are the different programs, what can I offer this family that has this particular need so that they access 
what's more um, important, what their student needs are. So, so those are the places in which we're really doing a lot of heavy outreach. And soon you're going to be seeing um, billboards and soon you're going to be hearing, I hope you hear it in English too, but I know that we're tapping into the, the media in, in the different languages of the community, but it's going to be out on, in the different paper, in the local papers. So that part of the very important advertising um, and getting the word out, as you said, is uh, actually a critical component of this work too. So thank you for Excellent. highlighting that. Great, thank you, and thank you. And um, I'm sure on time, I'll just briefly uh, address the other issue about uh, the survey. Many of us were reached out about it, so I'm glad we had the conversation about that. And I don't wanna repeat, I did think the conversation around how we communicate with parents and explain to them the rationale on it and you know how they could have conversations as well was really helpful and thoughtful, as was Superintendent, your comment about working with our mental health professionals on a more regular basis and that they're communicating it. Um, and just for point of information, I did take a look at earlier this week at the website. So if you look at the Youth Behavior Risk Survey website, which the CDC puts out, it looks like there's a two year lag time. So they say they're coming out this spring with 2021 data. The only thing you can see on the site now was 2019 data. So when it does come out, Superintendent, really look forward to you. Absolutely you know, presenting to us in conjunction with wellness, as you said, I think that would be really helpful because it is, you know, where we, you hear all of us talking about our students and our staffs and our families' um, mental health in these days. So Great. look forward to that data coming out, but appreciate the conversation. Um, and also you're yeah, having done the research about how the questions are formed and, and what say we have on that, so. Thank, Thank you for you. us. Thank I'm, you. I'm glad the conversation happened. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, but take, oops, let me see. Mr. Tron, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, no, I don't have any question. Okay. Um, I just have a quick one. Um, it was interesting to hear about the number of opportunities there will be um, for the summer. So my question is, are we, are there opportunities across the full spectrum of our students' ages and grades? Are there any points where there, there may be lags or not enough programming? Um, at what age can students apply for jobs versus what, at, what is the top age that we are offering some kind of focused programming? Um, in addition to obviously summer school, if that's needed. Yeah, um, so uh, uh, through three year, um, Dr. Tavares, I'm not aware of um, any gap um, in relative to the age for the program. Um, I think you know we're trying we're trying to offer, and I think the city is as well. And we didn't discuss that tonight, but I think the city is doing quite a bit on youth opportunity as well to to be able to uh, blanket right for our young people at all ages opportunities. Um, one of the things that we are we will be attempting to do with the job piece going forward. And we'll be able to do a little bit of this this year, but in, in full in full um, board next year, is to really marry the the career pathways that students are electing with their job opportunity in the summer, right? Because this is so important; it's relevant to what they're learning. So this is a big effort that we have um, ongoing with the chamber, um, but also with PIC. Um, that you know, this year we won't be able to hit it as hard as we want to. Um, because some of the career pathways are also still forming in the high schools. But going forward, that's going to be a, a big a big piece for that nine to twelve as they're um, engaged in their career pathway piece. <clears throat> uh, so Anna, any um anything you're aware of that um, should be of concern or something they were working toward relative to a, a lag with the grids? So as far as the grades, uh, superintendent, you hit it on the mark. We don't really see any um, any any points of age grouping that we're concerned that wouldn't have access to programming. And Chair Robinson, 14 is the age where you can apply for um, your first jobs, if you will, in the summer. Uh, 14 seems so young, but they're ready. And um, we had children as young as three in the STEM program that I mentioned earlier. 
which is really exciting and really young. So, so we have quite a bit of a range and, you know, and for our, our high school students to the point that um, Superintendent um, Skipper mentioned, like really tying it, the, the opportunities with internship is really something that we're very keen on. So definitely we have a very wonderful and robust opportunities for engagement for students of all grades and all ages. Great. Uh, one other thing, I know that we, uh, often our exam schools have some kind of orientation for students, even at the seventh and the ninth grade. And I know I've heard from other parents who are wishing that other high schools or transitional schools were also offering those kinds of, of programs and orientation to high school, whatever. And I was wondering if any of those things were being expanded for this year. That's a really wonderful question. And I'm going to actually ask um, uh, Dr. Cruz, um, Davis to, to share a little bit more. She has more of the details of that particular question and she'll be able to, to share that. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chairperson for the question. So yes, we are um, expanding our exam school initiative for this year and we're hoping to target um, a, um, a wider network if you would. In addition, we have summer learning academies which are being offered for students in order to prepare them for high school. So there are summer learning acad academies that are targeting seventh and eighth graders, sixth, mm -hmm. seventh and eighth graders. Okay, yeah. so, so what, what I was looking for is, so like, would there be, for example, at English High School that I know has a seven, a 12, strand, would there be an orientation to English, you know, English High School for incoming seventh graders? I mean, that kind of thing. So, so that I, I'd have to get back to you on. Okay. But, but I know that for there are definitely summer learning academies targeting those middle school grades in order to prepare them for, for high school. That's a great question, and and I I promise to get back to you on that. Right. All right. And, and what I will say, Chair, is that I there are a few of our high schools that do that in the seventh and eighth grade as they prepare them. Um, I believe Dearborn, Brighton. Um, but it really, this should be something we're doing across the board for young mm -hmm. people, because one of the things we're talking about is what's the information that we want to have yeah. processing with our seventh and ninth graders coming in for the first time that gives them the best opportunity to succeed and gives us the most information for them. Right. So um, that is, that is great. That is done in like a two week transition program, or it can be a four week. Um, so that is something that despite there being maybe fewer high schools right now doing it, that will be a push that as particularly we get in the career um, pathway pieces moving in early college that we will um, add in right in the in the future summers. The other group um, that I am gonna check on, but um, I know this was a push that we did in Somerville and I'd like to see us do it here is for our older students who are in transition programming who are special education students to do um, to, to make sure that we have at least a four week program for them going forward, because um, I think having that year round experience for them, and this is like uh, where we can continue to do travel training and the other kinds of transitional skill building that will make a difference to them. So that's gonna be an area I'm gonna look for um, and, uh, and try to build toward, because they're often forgotten in the sense that they're older students. They might be 19, 20, 21 years old. And yet um, our obligation and responsibility is to make sure that they are prepared for that next transition of life. So that's the one that came to my mind um, in needing to look at. Alrighty. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to entertain a motion to receive the superintendent's report. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The report is approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And um, we'll now move on to general public comment. Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, caregivers, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee 
on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but refer to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. We have nine speakers this evening. Each person will have three minutes to speak, and I will remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. Please direct your comments to the chair and refrain from addressing individual school committee members or district staff. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure that you're signed into Zoom with the same name that you used to sign up for public comment. And that will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. We'll begin this evening with Michael Heishman, followed by Ruby Reyes, Sharon Hinton, and Yamaris Matias. If you could please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Mr. Heishman. Mike Heishman, Beja, Dorchester. This evening, the school committee will vote in favor of next year's budget. Let us pretend. Pretend that we will provide the necessary resources so that many more of our children will attend safe, healthy, and modern buildings. Pretend that we will provide the necessary funding so then many more of our children will have a high quality and equitable education. The research has shown that smaller school communities are superior to larger ones. Declining Roman has its advantages. Smaller class sizes is a more space to add essential programs. Closing of schools is harmful. The BPS does so because it saves money and it is easier for central office to control fewer schools. The budget provides too many resources for policing and not enough to create healthy and safe school communities. The budget provides too many resources to prepare our children to take racist standardized tests. There is insufficient funding promoting the genius of our educators in programs that attempt to provide all of our children with a well-rounded, relevant, and joyful education. Ethnic studies is an excellent example. This budget has insufficient funds and funds that could be spent more wisely. You will pretend today that things will be better and vote to continue to bring harm to many of our children, their families, and our community. At our last meeting, I thank Ms. Skipper for publishing her organizational chart. Ms. Skipper, you forgot to thank me for giving you this idea. My previous request of these meetings that the superintendent share her organizational and demographic chart have been met with silence. On February 12th, I filed a freedom of information request for three charts. I only received one when Dr. Cecilius was our leader, dated July 1st, 2021. The comparison of both charts did not tell me what I wanted to know about the demographics of our central office leadership. My belief is that there are more white and fewer black leaders at the top of Ms. Skipper's hierarchy. However, the comparison of the charts was revealing. Directly under Dr. Caselius' chart was her deputy superintendent. Underneath him were nine departments. Right in the middle was chief of equity and strategy, Dr. Charles Granson. In Ms. Skipper's chart, Chief of Equity and Strategy, Dr. Charles Granson, had been removed to the far right, where he is one of three departments that report to Ms. Tavares. My understanding is that this office has been moved far away from Ms. Skipper and that his budget has been cut. Is that true? The comparison of the charts demonstrates what already has been clear to me. Equity is much less of a priority for our new school leader. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heishman. Our next speaker is Ruby Reyes.
My name is Ruby Reyes. I'm the executive director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance and Dorchester resident. School committee members are parading questions and cavalier comments about closing schools and budgets that do not have details. The budget presentations have not included enough details to make informed decisions, yet more than likely you will pass it. How can you as a school committee member think it is okay to pass something that you have very little information about, but have huge lasting implications for hurting school communities? Stop hurting students and families. Superintendent Skipper and your team are pretending everything is okay when things are not. Progress is not being made and the district is failing BPS students and families. It is your role as school committee members to not just ask questions, or, but to make decisions that are equitable and anti-racist. While the nine regional restorative justice coaches are in a step in the right direction, progress cannot stop there. If you have the audacity to propose 18 positions for community connections coordinators who would have targeted certain students, then you can invest at bare minimum 18 new positions into your supposed commitment to restorative justice. Ensure that what you say aligns with your actions and demonstrate change through action. Since 2018, the following schools have been closed, including the West Roxbury Educational Complex, which included both the Urban Science Academy and West Roxbury Academy, the Jackson Mann, Edwards, Timbalty, Mission Hill, and Irving schools. Mergers and proposed mergers, another form of school closures, have included the McCormick and BCLA, the Shaw and Taylor, and Summer and Philbrick. There has been repeated attempts to close the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. The district continues to inadequately serve students with disabilities. BPS families have experienced these closures and threats, but are consistently told their supposed commitment to transparency and trust building. The schools who have been threatened and closed have been schools with large populations of Black, Latino, students with disabilities, and English learners. The list of school closure decisions has made it very clear that when school committee members talk about different difficult decisions and closing schools because of enrollment decline, it is schools where the majority of students are Black, Latino, and students with disabilities and English learners. These decisions are racist, and you are advancing racism and deepening disinvestment when you vote in favor of them. You can continue to pretend everything will be okay, or you can practice anti-racism and begin making motions voting on budgets and making decisions that are at bare minimum have details and do not hurt communities that are majority Black, Latino, students with disabilities and English learners. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Hinton is not signed into the meeting. So our next speaker will be Yamaris Matias, followed by Maria Mejia, Amada Ravello, Paula Ortiz and Piedad Munoz. If you could please raise your hands and zoom. Hello. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hi, my name is Hermaris Matias and I'm a mother of two uh, in the school that I'm family is Ocean Gardens and also I'm a resident of Southern. I would like to talk a little bit about my experience in BPS as a parent. I have a good and bad experience. As we know, BPS is not 100% perfect. Are things that could do that I think it could be better. Starting with the Welcome Center staff, uh, which is not really followed through uh, with parents with the list of uh, schools that can be a pro uh, proper uh, fit for their families and especially the needs they have. I think, I mean, I believe, which is in hap it also happened to me and also been happening to many other parents. Uh, the Welcome Center should be a place that make you feel like they want you to be part of it. Not just come to you and say, oh, this is the list and you have three options to select the school. But they don't really um, go through the list and explain to you where are the needs and what can be a proper fit for you and your family. So one of the things I suggest for um, BPS is to have a better um, training and staff for we have a more hospitality and made the families welcome and showing that they care about their kids' education and what they what are the needs for them and what um, can be fixed on programs that uh, the child might need. Also, one of the things as a as well to be a BPS um, former student, I came from this uh, for the school to Madison Park. I believe 
um, it should be more uh, technical vocational high schools because no all kids are made to um, go to college, but it's another option for kids to choose another follow up career. Um, Madison Park should be one of the schools that can be, um, budget can be a little higher so the um, programs can be um, more organized and more appropriate for kids who would like um, to help them what they're gonna be the next professional step for them in the future. Um, so think about it, maybe having more uh, technical vocational programs for the school and as well um, make even Madison Park be a better school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, Maria Mejia, is not signed into the meeting. So I'll invite our Spanish interpreter to invite our next set of speakers. Um, next up is Amada Ravello. Amanda Ravello, por favor. Amada Ravello o Paulina Ortiz, por favor. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. O oh, me escuchan, no puedo ver nada. Sí, la escuchamos. ¿Cómo se okay, llama usted? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Amada Ravelo. Ok, my name is Amada Ravelo. Vivo en South Boston y pertenezco al Comité de Acción del Grupo de Padres San Steven. I live in South Boston and I, I'm part of the Parent Mentor Program at St. Stevens. Estoy aquí porque quiero abogar por los niños de educación especial que no tienen la transportación adecuada. I'm here to advocate for the children with special needs because they don't have the appropriate transportation. Estoy aquí dando este testimonio a nombre de una amiga que su niño le diagnosticaron un IP y por su comportamiento hiperativo no puede coger el bus escolar. I'm here on behalf of one of my friends whose child uh, got an, uh, through an IEP um, diagnosed with hyper um, hyperactivity and he cannot take the transportation. Ya han pasado más de dos meses y la madre tiene que llevar al niño día a día a la escuela. After two months, the mother has to bring her child every day to school. Porque BPS no le ha asignado un transporte. Because BPS has not assigned her transportation. Es importante que brinden un buen servicio de autobús, ya que muchos padres no tienen vehículo propio. It's important that BPS provides a good transportation because a lot of parents don't have a vehicle ni cuentan con muchos recursos para pagar transporte diario. Or count with a lot of resources to pay for transportation daily. Espero tomen mi voz en cuenta para ayudar a tantos padres que lo necesitan. Muchas gracias. I hope you keep my voice on, um, in mind to help as many parents as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Mejia, followed by Paula Ortiz. Maria Mejia, está aquí. Paula Ortiz. Sí, me escuchan. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. ¿Quién es? Maria Mejia. Adelante, Maria Mejia. Ok. Hola, buenas noches. Soy María Mejía y vivo en la comunidad de Rosberry. Good evening. My name is María Mejía and I live in the community of Roxbury. Mi hijo estudia en la escuela Blaston. My son attends the Blackton School. Y soy co-chair de DILAC. And I'm a co-chair of DILAC. Como madre, tengo una inquietud. As a mother, I have a concern. Quiero saber qué, qué programas están incluidos para educación especial y el presupuesto en el presupuesto. I want to know 
what special need programs are included in the budget? Queremos más personal especializado que trabajen eh, con nuestros niños especiales como trabajadores sociales y psicólogos. We want more specialized staff who works with our children with special needs as social workers and psychologists. Vimos que están colocando mucho dinero en los, en los en, en impuestos que estarán fuera de las escuelas. We noticed that you're putting a lot of money in positions outside of the schools. En realidad, lo que necesitamos es más personal dentro de las escuelas de nuestros hijos. In fact, what we need is more staff who works in the schools where our children are. Como dije anteriormente, más trabajadoras sociales. As I said before, more social workers. Más consejero de apoyo socioemocional. More social emotional guidance. Más maestro que realmente sean bilingüe entre otros. More teachers who are really bilingual among others. A mi entender, Boston reúne las cualidades y condiciones para ser modelo a seguir de otras ciudades. To my understanding, Boston uh, meets the qualities and conditions to be a model for Espera other cities. Esperamos que nuestras voces y decisiones como padres sean tomadas en cuenta. We hope that our voices and decisions as parents are kept in mind. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Ortiz. Paula Ortiz. Por favor. Adelante, Paula Ortiz. Sí, buenas noches. Yes, good evening. Este, mi nombre es Paula Ortiz. My Vivo, name is Paula Ortiz. Vivo en Dorchester. I live in Dorchester. Pertenezco a la comunidad de padres de San Stephen. I belong to the parents community of St. Stephen's. Mis hijos fueron a la escuela pública de Boston. My children, uh, uh, children attended the Boston Public Schools. Estoy aquí para abogar por la escuela pública. I'm here to advocate for the Boston Public Schools. Ya que mis hijos fueron a ellas. Since my children attended them. En el caso de mis hijos, que tenía... In the case, el, of, uh -huh. in, in the case of my son, que tenía, has, que tenía su hijo en... Who, who, uh -huh. I apologize. Who had his children in BPS? Yeah. Toda la semana tenía problema con el transporte. Every week he used to have problems with the transportation. El bus no llegaba y él llegaba tarde a su trabajo. The bus wouldn't arrive and he would be late for, for work. Porque tenía que ir a dejar a los nietos a la escuela. Because he was forced to bring the uh, my grand, grandchildren to school. Esto pasaba hasta dos veces por semana. This was happening up to two, two times per week. Por favor, pido a las autoridades aquí presentes que nos ayuden a solucionar este problema de las transportación. I ask the authorities here to please help us to resolve this problem of the transportation. Otra cosa, quiero mencionar something, eh, something else that I want to mention. Uh -huh. 
que mi nieto tuvo problemas con otro niño y no that, veo justo. That my grandchild had a problem with another kid and I don't think it's fair. Que suspendan a un estudiante aunque sea culpable en su acto. That a student get suspended even if he's guilty of the fact. Pero nunca hicieron una reunión con los padres. But never, they never um, uh, organized a meeting with the parents. Y yo como abuela veo eso mal. And as a grandmother, I see that wrong. Los padres tienen el derecho de saber el por qué. The parents have the right to know why. Lo están suspendiendo y tener una reunión con la maestra y los padres del otro alumno. Uh, they have the right to know why they're, get, they're getting suspended and to have a meeting with the teacher and the parents of the other kid. Gracias por escucharme. Feliz noches. Thank you for listening to me. Good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Piedad Minos. Piedad Muñoz está aquí. Piedad Muñoz, le toca hablar. Ah, ok. Sí, buenas, buenas noches. Buenas noches, good evening. Um, bueno, gracias por, por escuchar. Thank eh, you for nombre, listening to me. Eh, mi nombre es Piedad Muñoz y yo soy, um, soy del, del grupo de padres de San Steven. My name is uh, Piedad Muñoz and I'm part of the uh, group of San Stevens. Um, soy madre de dos estudiantes de BPS. I'm the mother of two students of BPS. Y en la noche de hoy, uh, quiero expresar como, mambre, como madre y miembro de la comunidad lo importante que considero eh, que debe ser el proveer más apoyo emocional a los estudiantes y a las familias. And tonight, I want to express as mother and as a member of the community, how important it is uh, to provide more social emotional support to the students and families at BPS. Eh, actualmente, las escuelas cuentan con apoyo emocional y esto lo, lo hemos reiterado en varias ocasiones. Uh, inclusive ahorita ustedes también estaban mencionando todo el apoyo que se le está dando um, a nuestros estudiantes. Right now, the schools have uh, some kind of emotional support. And as you were mentioning a little bit ago also of all the, uh, the resources that you're using to, into that. Sí, así como los trabajadores sociales, psicólogos, Pero sin embargo, like the social workers and psychologists, but nevertheless, uh, la pandemia ha exacerbado la necesidad de más recursos y programas para ayudar a, a nuestros jóvenes eh, con muchos traumas. The pandemic has increased the need of more resources and programs that can help uh, to. Um, to move on and, and superate a lot of the traumas. Y necesidades eh, de nuestra comunidad. And needs of our community. Por ejemplo. For instance. Um, las escuelas que sirven un significativo número de estudiantes inmigrantes. The schools that serve a significant number of immigrant students. Y, o aprendices del idioma inglés or English learners necesitan eh, mucho más de esos recursos need those resources much more eh, perdón eh, incluso ay perdón de mi minuto um, Incluso sería muy importante que BPS compartieran reportes 
de cuántos eh, compartiera reportes continuos de, de cuántos casos se asignan a, a diferentes trabajadores sociales o psicólogos. It would even be very important that BPS uh, would share regular reports of how many cases are assigned approximately to each social worker. O psicólogos, para así, para así minimizar esa brecha que, que, que pudiese existir de comunicación, porque va a ser muy abrumador tanto para un estudiante como para un, para un trabajador eh, en el área emocional con los niños social workers or psychologists because sometimes it can be very frustrating to have so many cases at the same time. BPS y la Alcaldía de Boston también deberían reforzar los programas disponibles después de escuela. BPS and the major office should also uh, should also reinforce the programs available after school ya que el, apo el apoyo socioemocional también debe incluir acceso a programas. Because the social emotional support should also include the access to programs. Como, como eh, yoga, meditación, eh, baile, música, artes like, marciales. Like yoga, meditation, dance, and martial arts. Y, Gracias, Ms. Muñiz. Y también es importante. Gracias, señora que, Muñiz, se acabó su tiempo. Ah, oh, ok, solamente otro, otra cosita. Eh, continuamente estamos viendo en los vecindarios que el incremento de la violencia en nuestras calles y en nuestras escuelas. Uh, just one more thing, I apologize, that we are seeing every time more and more uh, violence in our streets and our schools. Y si nosotros contamos con los Ms. estudiantes, Ms. hacemos a los Ms. estudiantes Ms. que sean parte ya no puede de, seguir. de este problema, por favor. también sean parte de la solución. If you're part of the problem, also be part of the solution. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Mora, and I'll invite our Cape Verdean interpreter, Josiane, to support Maria. Maria Mora. Maria Mora. Sí. Puede, puede seguir en frente. Ok. Sí. Uh, mi nombre es Maria Mora. Vive en Roxbury. Y está haciendo parte del grupo de Sam Stevens. My name is Maria Mora. I live in Roxbury and I'm part of St. Stevens Group. Um, tengo una crianza de, con necesidades especiales y está estudiando en la escuela de Blackstone. I have a special needs kid that studies in the Blackstone School. Y no está allí para una presenta mi experiencia con transporte escolar y esta tuve que llevar a mi hijo más de una vez a la escuela. And I'm here to present my experience with school transportation and this year I had to take my kid to school more than once. Y año pasado pasa también lo mismo. And last year the same thing happened. Y es muy difícil para mí cuando horario de bus te muda o entonces que bus cada chico. It's very hard for me when the bus schedule changes or when the bus doesn't arrive. Eh, mi hijo te fica muy ansioso cuando te espera el tocar por mucho tiempo. My son gets really anxious when he waits for the bus for too long. Eh, Além disso, a mim tem vivido me só. Eh, nunca tem outro alguém que tá, pode cuidar dele. E nunca tem transporte próprio. And apart from that, I live by myself. I don't have anyone else that can take care of him. 
and I don't have my own private transportation. In tem compromisso com o trabalho. And I also have the commitment of going to work. E quando é assim, é atrapalhando o dia todo, ainda corre ter risco de perder trabalho. And when that happens, it really messes up my day, and I even have the risk of losing my job. E por isso, ainda pedi autoridades escolares que, por favor, que estou em conta minha petição. And uh, that's why I ask school authorities to please take into consideration my plea. Porque está seguro que me é a única que está passa para esse problema com o transporte escolar. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one going through this problem with school transportation. E na minha casa que tem um tador não cada vez mais difícil ainda que tem uma criança com necessidade especial. And in my case, it's even harder because I have a special needs kid. Então, uh, muito obrigado e, por favor, levem em conta minha situação. And so, thank you very much and please take into consideration, keep in mind my situation. Thank you. Obrigada. Chair Robinson, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan, and thank you to those of you who spoke this evening and shared your experiences. Your testimony is very important to us. Our first action item this evening is grants for approval. After further conversations with the finance team, we need to separate these grants out and vote on a future date on the SEL mental health grant because the de details needed to be finalized before they are ready to be brought forth to the committee. Therefore, we will take two votes on the grants. First, a vote to separate the grants, removing the cell mental health grant in the amount of $39,350, and a second vote to approve the revised grant package, which will total $199,000. Are there any questions on the process? Okay. There's nothing. I will now entertain a motion to divide agenda seven action items grants for approval by separating cell mental health grant FC 311 in the amount of $39,350 from the grants for approval as recommended by the superintendent. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Is there second. a second? Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Kaidad Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. I'll now entertain a motion to approve the revised grants for approval totaling 199,000 as recommended by the superintendent as and as amended by the Boston School Committee. Is there a motion? Point, yes. Point of order, are we supposed to be able to ask questions about the this grant package before we vote on it? We should be able to, yes. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I just read that. I saw that too. And I'm like, wait a minute. We need to have a chance to discuss the rest of them. So yeah, so I'll open it up to discussion and then we'll take the vote. Are there any questions around the, um, the grants package as we see? Dr. Alkin. Um, yes, actually just one in, in relation to the, the early college support grant. Um, you know, seeing that the desired outcomes are like increased enrollment um, into pathways like via um, at Charlestown High School, Dearborn STEM. Um, just do we have any particular updates on successes from the previous round um, of investment here? Uh, three, three a chair. So I, I think if Lydia is on,
Yes, I'm, I'm here. Great, great. So just to be able to speak to um, kind of what the preliminary results of the pathways that currently have early college as we kind of go this next uh, grant round to, uh, to deepen those pathways. Absolutely. Um, so this grant update is actually an increase in funding from the, pre the last round from DESE, um, specifically to increase support services for multilingual learners at Dearborn um, and Charlestown High School. Um, and so those two schools applied for additional funds for both summer programming, um, ESL instructors to provide tutoring for students, um, and to be able to um, launch summer programs as well in partnership with their higher ed um, partners, both Bunker Hill Community College um, and Wentworth Institute of Technology. Um, over this past year through previous investments from DESE, we've been able to increase the number of early college programs in the district and actually um, just received uh, last week at the joint committee um, uh, new designations at uh, New Mission High School, Fenway High School, Boston Community Leadership Academy, and Brighton High School. Um, so those investments have opened up four new pathways in our secondary schools. Um, we have around 270 students enrolled in our early college programs currently this year, um, and we are on track to double that enrollment for the upcoming year through these investments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And this so and you're looking at what um about 75 percent what percentage are we at now sorry let me just so we will have our final um credit accumulation counts by the end of the year um you still students who are um enrolling in their spring semester of coursework makes sense yeah, but we're, you know, can certainly provide an update on that um, at the end of um, the school year. Thank you. Yep. Are there any additional questions, comments? If not, I will now entertain a motion. Um, oh. uh, yeah, so oh, sorry, on uh on the the teacher retention grant um i'm confused as to what exactly is um what exactly is being done to help uh teacher retention uh i think dr granson if you want to uh to speak to um, some of the efforts on teacher retention that are connected to the grant. Absolutely, um, and thanks for the question, Mr. Meta. Um, so we have um, a number of uh, efforts underway. One of the things that we do is uh, try to bring people together to build community. Um, and so when we look at the research around teacher retention, a lot of it uh, speaks to not having a sense of belonging, belonging um, and being connected. Uh, to a larger community, either in their school um, or their overall school district. So we offer um, what we call um, Alana uh, events that um, brings together all of our teachers of color. Typically happens once a month. And then we also use it as an opportunity to have colleges and universities co-sponsor it with us. And so they come in, uh, Northeastern, for example, recently just sponsored one. They speak to the scholarships and the programs that they have uh, within um, that they offer. And one of the things that they offer with, um, like, for example, our McFarlane, McFarlane Scholars Program um, is opportunities for teachers to get master's degrees or those who are trying to go from a para to a teacher teacher to um, move, um, uh, attain additional uh, professional uh, degree programs. Um, it also uh, allows us to um, have direct contact with uh, teachers. And so we have two staff, two full-time staff members, and we're working on a third one to uh, call and reach out to about a thousand teachers who we have who are teachers of color, um, who many of them are either in different places with their licensure. Um, they maybe have um, were on an emergency license during a pandemic. 
Um, and now we have to really coach them through the licensure process. Um, in some cases, get them enrolled in educator prep program. In some cases, it's having them uh, take advantage of our um, internal um, educator prep programs, um, which is the BPS teaching fellowship, for example, or accelerated community teacher program. Um, and in some cases, it's really just helping them navigate, which is often the big obstacle, which is um, MTEL support. Um, and so we're offering, I would say, the, the next large bucket around teacher uh, retention is we have uh, Intel support classes that we offer. Um, currently, uh, upwards of a thousand teachers are um, taking advantage of those courses. Um, and once they complete the course, um, then we work with them to make sure they get registered uh, for the exam. Um, and then we have a pretty high rate of passage, but if some don't pass, that's what makes them eligible for the teacher waiver. Um, and so we still stick with them throughout the process, even if they aren't able to um, uh, pass the exam the first time around. Hope that answers your question, Mr. Meadow. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I will now entertain a motion to approve the revised grants for approval totaling 199,000 as recommended by the superintendent and as amended by the Boston School Committee. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The revised grant package is approved as approved unanimously. Thank you. Our next action item is the superintendent's final fiscal year 24 general fund budget recommendation in the amount of $1,445,729,446. Before I open it up to the committee, final comments, I'd like to invite the superintendent to offer some final thoughts. Thank you, Chair Robinson. And I, I just wanna start by thanking the committee and the, the public in general for just the engagement, the input throughout you know, the several month process. Um, as we've said all along, budget is a reflection of our values. And the FY24 budget helps us as a transitional budget um, to really prepare for FY25 fiscal cliff and um, set our initiatives up with foundation work. We begin the process a year early um, to really begin to transition um, essential ESSER dollars and positions into the general fund. And I think this was an important piece of helping the field and us to um, prepare for that moment in time. Um, and to really give thought to how the resources that we have at our schools are aligning to the priorities that are evolving, um, both through all of the reports and the audits that we've received, as well as the priorities that um, we've set. Um, we can't get everything we want with the time we have, um, but through this budget process, we've worked with school leaders, with departments, certainly with chiefs and with the deputies to to really kind of build the budget muscles that we haven't used in the past years when we've had to make priority decisions, and we will certainly in the years to come. Um, we began the conversations required for the collective understanding of the priorities that we have and for our strategy um, in, the, in the strategic thinking that goes along with them, that's we're gonna be really needed to provide our students with the resources that they need going forward. Um, a vote tonight is not the end of the discussion, it's actually the starting point for our future planning. Um, and one that we are eager for, um, you know, to to move on and to uh, continue to do that deep planning throughout the summer, the spring, the summer, and then the fall um, with our school communities. We're building on things that are working and strengthening the areas that need support so that going forward, BPS will be the stable, high-functioning district that our families, our staff, our students need and deserve and are asking for. So there's a lot of work to do, and um, I've never been more optimistic about the direction that we're headed. Um, you know, we know that there's that there's a there's a lot of work ahead of us, 
Um, but this is the work that is the meaningful work that we all do why we why we what we do and why we do it. It's to be able to make that difference to our students, um, particularly our students who have been underserved in our district, our black and brown, our special education, and our MLE students. So I respectfully ask for your support tonight um, and vote on this budget. So with that, Madam Chair, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. I'll now open it up to commit to the committee for final comments. Dr. Hawkins. Um, yes, there's been a lot of sort of just thoughts back and forth, particularly just throughout all the, the conversation. So I think I first want to say thank you to everyone that's been a part of these conversations and process over the past two months. Um, Lord knows it hasn't been easy and it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful to the the, the, the late hours of presentation generation and data gathering um, so that we could have presentations to, to, to think from and ask questions. Um, so first that um, there's a lot of positives in this budget. There's also, you know, things that I'm not quite sure of. And, you know, I entered the day in that space um, first, I love the idea that it brings our union contracts to be current. Um, it does signal priority areas of the district by the particular $26 million strategic investments. Um, I think it also is a springboard for conversations, particularly with the city and also private industry. And I mean, I think that's just a signal that we should be sending as a committee that private industries in the city need to be investing in the educational development or cultivating of a, a potential new workforce. Um, uh, additionally, um, I think the city should be investing more. And I think that's a conversation that we're going to be faced with in the next year, especially. Um, this is, as I've said before, a building block budget. Um, still reticent about what it's actually doing for our most um, for our most underserved populations. Um, we've talked a lot about the the fiscal cliff that we're we're heading toward, and there's no escaping the conversation that we need to rapidly consolidate our schools. And there seems to be this, I think, understanding across the district that that needs to happen but that it needs to be done in a way that is equitable and that is inclusive of those communities that are going to be affected. That said, those communities that are primarily affected are uh, students that look like me, students that look like a, a number of folks on, on, on the committee, and um, definitely our multilingual learners and our multilingual learners with disabilities. And it seems that by keeping schools open, we're a sort of bleeding money. Um, and in that sense, for me, the I've always felt like the budget should be a little bit more radical in the approaches that we're taking. Um, and that's sort of left me and, and that's just been my thought throughout the throughout the day and just going back and forth on that. Um, whether it's restorative justice, whether it's our inclusive education strategy, um, how we've involved task forces along the process. So, um, you know, that's, but I do want to, but I just want to name all of the different perspectives and all the, the, the good things that are in there, but also some of the things that I'm still not clear about where we're, where we're headed as a district. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll stop it there. Thank you. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Gracias, Madam Chair. Quiero empezar agradeciéndole a el staff de la superintendente por trabajar eh, eh, sobre el presupuesto. Sé que han puesto muchas horas de su tiempo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to start by thanking uh, the superintendent's team. Uh, for all the hours that I know they have spent working on the budget. 
Pero también puntualizar y agradecer a las organizaciones comunitarias, a la comunidad, a los padres, maestros y estudiantes que han estado aportando y han venido a la mesa a traer sus ideas también e inquietudes. But I also want to thank the community partners, the parents, the students, the educators who have brought their opinions to us. Desde el primero de febrero hemos estado hablando, hemos estado teniendo sesiones para conocer el presupuesto que tendremos para el 2024. Since February, um, we have been having sessions to get to know the budget we will have for 2024. Nos han explicado que este es un presupuesto que servirá como un presupuesto de transición crítico para abordar algunas necesidades inmediatas mientras también empezamos a planear eh, el, para el 2025 y más. We have been explained that this was a budget that will serve as a critical transition budget to address some immediate needs as we also begin planning for 2025 and beyond. Todos sabemos que la mayoría del presupuesto que se asigna a cada escuela depende del número de estudiantes que tenga cada escuela. We all know that most of the budget allocated to each school depends on the number of students each school has. Y cuando la escuela tiene estudiantes con necesidades especiales, le asignan más dinero por estudiante. And when the school has students with special needs, they allocate more money per student to them. Entonces debemos estar claros entonces sobre la importancia que tienen nuestros estudiantes y las familias. Then we must be clear about the importance of our students and families. Ellos componen una de las partes más importantes de un sistema educativo. Since they make up for one of the most important parts of an educational system. En ese sentido, pienso que el presupuesto presenta that, pasos de avances que puedo destacar. In that sense, I think that this budget presents steps of progress that I can highlight. Cosas buenas. Están poniendo más, más dinero en educación multilingüe o programas que son bilingües. Good things is like uh, the, the fact that they're putting more money into multilingual education or programs that are bilingual. Están poniendo también más dinero en educación inclusiva. They're also putting more money for inclusive education. Pondrán más tecnología en el transporte, en el sistema de transporte. They will put more technology in the transportation. Han dado más dinero a monitores de autobuses. They have given more money to bus monitors. Y van a crear una oficina de manejo de emergencia. And they're going to create an emergency management office. Entiendo que estos son puntos buenísimos y de avance. I understand that all of these are excellent points of progress. Pero hay muchas inquietudes que no puedo dejar de mencionar hoy porque de no hacerlo no estaría haciendo mi trabajo como una miembro del comité escolar. But there are many concerns that I cannot fail to mention today because otherwise I would not be doing my job as a member of the school committee. He tenido conexiones con muchas escuelas a las que no les era cortado el presupuesto y esto está bien. I've had connection with many schools which will not receive cuts in their budgets and that's fine. No le quitan, pero tampoco agregan más dineros. They're not taking any money from them, but they're not adding any money either. Existen preocupaciones por saber qué va a pasar con aquellas escuelas que, que tendrán salones de inclusión, especialmente tomando en cuenta que el distrito ha dicho que en el presupuesto 
han colocado una cantidad de dinero considerablemente para impulsar la educación inclusiva. There are concerns to know what's going to happen to those schools that will have inclusion classrooms, especially taking into account that the district has said that in the budget they have placed a considerable amount of money to promote inclusive education. Pero, esta es la pregunta. ¿Cómo podemos asegurar que las escuelas que más necesitan dinero lo van a recibir? Y segundo, ¿en uh, dónde on. está uh, el chequeo de equidad? So this is the question. Uh, how can we ensure that the schools that need the money the most will receive it? And second, ¿cuál es la segunda otra vez? Por ¿En dónde está el chequeo de equidad? And where is the checkup of equity? Pensando equity. En, exactly. Pensando bien rápidamente ya, pensando en educación multilingüe o en programas que son bilingües. Thinking really fast about the multilingual education or programs that are bilingual. Las familias necesitan saber cómo apoya el presupuesto del año fiscal 2024 la expansión del acceso al idioma nativo. The families need to know how the uh, fiscal year 24 budget supports expanding, expanding native language access. Más allá de los 750 mil dólares para los costos de crear programas de dos idiomas. Beyond the $750,000 for the costs of creating a dual language program. Nos interesa saber en concreto los gastos, montos de dólares, así como sus estimaciones del número total de estudiantes con, con potencialmente impactados en el 2023-24, especialmente 24. We are interested in knowing specifically the expenses and amounts in dollars, as well as their estimates of the total number of students potentially impacted in the school year 23-24, especially 24. En la pasada reunión del comité escolar, yo person estuve preguntando sobre la compañía que, que se iba a contratar para el transporte. In the previous uh, school committee meeting, I was specifically specifically asking about the company we were going to use for transportation. Responsablemente quiero decirles esta noche que tengo muchas preocupaciones con la compañía que va a ser contratada. And I have to tell you tonight that I'm very unhappy with the company that is going getting hired. Está bien que vamos a tener más tecnología para el transporte. It's perfect that we're going to have more technology for the transportation. Pero las familias tienen mucha preocupación y mucho descontento con el sistema de transporte que, ha estado, que han estado recibiendo todo este tiempo con la misma compañía. But the families have a lot of concerns and are very unhappy with the transportation system that they have been receiving with this company. Tal es el caso de una madre que perdió su trabajo porque el transporte de su hijo nunca llegaba a tiempo. This is the case of a mother who just lost her job because her child's transportation never arrived on time. Y por esto ella llegaba tarde al trabajo, lo que le ocasionó que fuera despedida del trabajo. And she was always late for work, so she was fired. Y hay otros y otros casos más que, que, que he podido conocer a lo largo de todo esto, de este tiempo. And I've heard so many other cases uh, along this time. Es importante escuchar a las familias. It's very important to listen to the families. Y por favor, preguntarles, preguntarles a ellas, a las familias, a, las usuar a los usuarios del transporte escolar, ¿qué piensan ellos? And to ask the families, the users of this transportation system, what they think about it. Porque ellos al final son los que están pasando y sufriendo las consecuencias. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones suffering the consequences. 
en este caso, ellos tienen que ser la voz más fuerte aquí. In this case, they should be the strongest voice here. Tenemos mucho tiempo cuestionando los servicios que han estado ofreciendo esta compañía. We've been questioning the services of this company for a long time. Sin resultados. With no results. O han ofrecido promesas vacías. They have made empty promises. Me pregunto, ¿cuál es la garantía de calidad que tenemos? I ask myself, what is the uh, quality warranty we get? Y conversemos sobre, abramos conversaciones sobre si esto es realmente una buena opción contratar nuevamente esta compañía. And let's have open discussions about to decide if it's a good idea to rehire this company. Finalmente, quiero decir otra preocupación que tengo que lo he externado anteriormente y es con los fondos Excel. And finally, I want to express my concern with the Ether funds. Desafortunadamente, para septiembre del año 2024, ya no tendremos estos fondos. Unfortunately, for September 2024, we won't have these funds anymore. Y dicen los estudios que se espera una crisis fiscal. And the studies uh, mentioned that we are expecting a financial crisis. Definitivamente tenemos que continuar conversaciones. We definitely, definitely have to continue the talks. Para encontrar mejores soluciones. To be able to find better solutions. Debemos crear un plan sostenible. We must create a sustainable plan. Hay puestos que se perderán cuando estos fondos terminen. Some jobs will be lost when these funds end. ¿Cómo van a involucrar a los padres y a las familias en estas decisiones? How are you going to involve parents and families in those decisions? No podemos olvidar los detalles. We cannot forget about the details. Si no somos Claros, no, no estamos siendo transparentes. If we are not clear, we are not being transparent. Definitivamente debemos continuar las conversaciones sobre este presupuesto que hoy vamos a, a hoy se va a votar. En ese sentido, eh, yo apoyo la creación de un grupo operativo, un grupo operativo Task Force que incluya a la comunidad, a padres, a estudiantes y maestros que puedan seguir planificando y establecer lineamientos más claros y transparentes para nuestros estudiantes y para poder lograr mejores resultados de nuestros estudiantes. We should definitely continue the conversations about this budget that will be voted on today. And in that sense, I support the creation of a task force, which includes the community, the parents, the students and teachers who can suggest, plan and establish, establish clearer and more transparent guidelines for our students and to be able to achieve the best outcomes in our students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Just, um, I want to thank the members who went before me too um, for their comments. Uh, I don't know where to start. Superintendent, I, I guess it makes sense just to say how thankful I am to you and for your leadership through this process, but also since you've arrived, the conversations here have gotten so much better. And I think uh it's just so clear how you're leading with transparency and honesty and i'm really thankful that you're willing to say many of the quiet parts out loud that a lot of folks have not been brave enough to to, to discuss and and i appreciate you tonight you know honoring what has been in discussion for years here around earlier enrollment for summer programs and more options for vulnerable kids and even sharing your thinking around how to bring more access for transition age students with with pretty complex profiles 
um, into specialized programming over the summer. <clears throat> and while I don't, you know, transparently, while I don't support this budget, it's not a reflection of not supporting you. You know, I'm optimistic about your leadership and I know that this is a healthy and loving disagreement uh, because we both care about kids. And so I hope you know uh, that I will not be voting in favor of the budget tonight, but I am your partner in this work, uh, whatever budget gets approved and I'll be here with you and for our students. But in many ways, some of my concerns predate you. These are concerns I raised over the last year and I raised during our last budget process. Um, and I've raised through this budget process and I just don't feel like it's been appropriately addressed. So to put it sort of bluntly, uh, while I value the idea of a, a transitional budget, this budget for me feels, and maybe it's around the lack of clarity, feels fiscally irresponsible and misaligned with some of the fiscal realities we know we're about to face. Fiscal realities that we all know will have very real life altering consequences for families, for students, for educators, for support staff in our district. So going down the road of continuing to increase our budget and choosing not to make decisions and or projecting around consolidations or cost reductions in programs or in existing vacancies that we haven't filled and having no sort of forward looking fiscal and enrollment analysis, it feels like a dereliction of my duty. You know, with ESSER, we had an opportunity to, to provide pandemic recovery support. Uh, I've said it multiple times, I thought it was a real opportunity to really shake things up and get creative with how we think about school, learning, staff retention, student access. During last year's budget process, I stressed my concern uh, about hiring positions that we couldn't fill and building out a bigger central team that would further cannibalize a workforce, particularly teachers, uh, when we knew we were experiencing increased attrition. And I stressed my concern about those positions and I was promised that that wasn't gonna be the case. We were gonna fill all of the vacancies. That I mean, we can go back and look at the videos. Like that was the promise we were told and it's just not true. And I have suggested other ways to think about ESSER funds that didn't include hiring people. Uh, I suggested incentivizing hiring bonuses for hard to staff schools and working with the BTU to make that happen or uh, retention bonuses for key personnel to stop attrition or, or help families during a time of inflation or putting cash in kids' pockets so that they were coming to school and we could compete with the job market that's drawing kids out of classrooms. Instead, and I understand the strategy and I can even become aligned with it, we're using it to cushion and lengthen the timeline for decisions that we know are inevitable. Decisions that will require us to explicitly name our system's challenges around enrollment, teacher shortages, staffing vacancies across the organization, and then name the road to fiscal sustainability and service of building schools that we can truly operationalize for kids. So rather than using ESSER to transition us to a more sustainable system, this budget is going to use $196 million to sort of perpetuate a deep problem that we had before there was a massive infusion of federal funds. The problem that, as I sort of referenced in the bit, bit beginning, was not in service of kids, but really about adults not willing to say the hard part out loud and not providing people with the data to, that will help them understand the current state of play. And the facts that we're not discussing in the budget that I wish were there was that, you know, since 2017, our enrollment's down 7,000 students, but we've hired over 2,000 employees. We have close to 500 teaching positions in the current school year that we can't staff. Uh, there's over 100 paraprofessionals uh, vacancies in our system. We have hundreds of central office vacancies. Our classrooms on average are like 85% enrolled. Our physical footprint, it like far exceeds our need. And it means we're operating and maintaining what some people are saying is 16 or more school buildings more than we should be. We've spent 
150 plus million dollars in the last three years on keeping the system afloat through soft landing, $68 million this year alone. Um, and that means we're keeping kids in classrooms without certified teachers. And like I, that for me feels, and you know this because I keep talking about it every time we're together, like it's incomprehensible and I couldn't accept it if it was my own child. Um, we have kids without certified teachers, without consistent paras, without enough guidance support. And that's because we're not consolidating schools so that kids have the learning experiences that you and I both agree they deserve. Uh, revenues are predicted to decrease next year, right? Like we will not have the additional $196 million in ESSER funds we're spending this in this year's budget. And we know, unless there's some sort of act of God, that enrollment will probably be down. And our costs are expected to increase one just because of inflation like everything's more expensive and then we have contractual increases as we do the important work that you're doing with us and for us to bring labor contracts up to date but for me i think with all of those facts it sort of like it defies common sense that we would choose to make the system more costly and sort of more difficult to adjust downward in the coming year and more difficult to get certified educators in front of kids when we see such a big gap right now, when we need it the most, particularly on a path to recovery. Like with the current increases, I'm just not even sure how it aligns to our strategic priorities. Like I don't really see how we're like doubling down to accelerate special education inclusion or increase safety through risk restorative practices. I just see like a lot of the same strategy, just hiring a few more people here and there. And it's hard for me to make sense of. And that might just be because I don't, it doesn't fully make sense to me yet. I think, you know, any person understands that when you find out you're losing a major source of income, you don't, I just can't imagine that you then add to the budget without a plan to backfill it. Like you can't buy a house or a long-term expense without a strategy for how to keep it. And because in this case, the major expense we're talking about, it's people. It's not a house or a car that we can sell later. We're adding 230 new positions, mostly funded by ESSER. That's 230 people on top of the current vacancies that we will either have to lay off next year or in subsequent years or hope that the city has the extra hundred million dollars to cover their salaries and benefits. And sadly, none of that could be true, but I keep saying it and no one is giving me clarity around what it is. And so that part's really hard for me. Like I think in a different type of organization, maybe one that's even private, like the transition is actually hiring freeze before you move into the sort of right sizing that we're at. And this feels mixed message. It's like we're going to grow and then reduce. I think I've asked for some of this information to be part of the budget. And it just, it hasn't come in, maybe because it's political, maybe because we don't know, maybe because it's scary to say it out loud and it'll create a lot of noise and tension. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't been there for me. And I'm, I can't in good conscience support the budget, but like, I hope you know, I support you in this work and I hope we can get to a budget that addresses my concerns. And I'm going to end here. Like, I disagree with the idea that our time is up and that we have to revert, revert back to the first budget you presented. That's um, right. That's great. I, the clock has not run out. And I think we can still build a truly transitional budget that we present to council. Like we can add an emergency meeting if we need to. But I just like, I, I don't wanna be in a place where we're sort of lying to ourselves and saying that like, we're done and this is it. And like, we have to make the decision tonight. I think that's how we get into problems that we can't fix. Um, and I hope that we can do that. I hope we can pause for a second and like get to a place of better clarity so that we can have a real transitional budget that we all feel clear about. And that helps us ensure that we have the workforce 
to do the most central part of our work, which is literally teaching kids. And I worry that this budget makes it harder for us to do that. Uh, so those are my thoughts and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cadet Hernandez. There are other. Mr. Maida. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you so much, Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Um, I, I mean, that's, that's a whole, that's a huge concern that we ha all have. And I'm just, I'd just like to say thank you for putting it into the correct words. Cause I mean, <laughs> like, we're driving off a cliff, man. So that's all I'm gonna say. Um, Thank you, Mr. Meta. Mr. Tron. Thank you. Thank you for all the uh, comments and um, concerns that are raised by all the uh, all other members. Unlike one, of, unlike a member who just mentioned that it's uh, it would be against his conscience to vote for for if he vote for this. Uh, Budget. Let me say this. In my own, in my own assessment, in the final analysis of everything that are on the table, given the fact that if if there is if there is nothing coming out of this tonight, the uh, the subsequent steps is something that I don't believe is, is good for the students at all. So contrary to what he stated, this is my statement. It would be unconscionable for me to vote against it tonight. So my conscience is maybe, maybe my conscience very different from, from his conscience, but this is the time I'm gonna put it right out there. Of course. We don't agree with each other all the time. But if we are going to say everything is for the, the students, I don't care what kind of politics we are playing. The students comes first. So it is unconscionable for me to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tran. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I do appreciate, um, first of all, the work that the district has done. So the superintendent, um, the finance team, Mr. Pudu and the rest of the finance team, the work they've done with schools to work in this budget starting back in the fall. This has been a two month process for us. We've asked a lot of questions. It is clear as has been talked about tonight this committee has had concern over some issues for, for several years, how we approached ESSER. We had a variety of opinions. I, I you know, I, I think of the expression that this committee is, has enough room to have a variety of inputs and we're all professionals. We all care about our children that we are serving. I learn from every member when they talk, including Mr. Matter as our student member, because that's how we learn and we think and we reflect and um, we may come to different conclusions and that's okay. Um, but, you know, um, my wife always says to me, assume good intent. And I certainly do <laughs> as a cynical Bostonian because I learned from the viewpoints and the questions that uh, the fellow members 
ways. And I, I appreciate the, the health and the depth of the conversation during this entire process. I think we have raised legitimate concerns about um, you know, what is gonna be happening in future years, what's going on with our infrastructure, um, the choice that has been made, the, the intent of the ESSA funds was to help districts recover and help our students recover learning loss. So return and recover in particular. And a strategic decision was made that the way this, one way that this district was spending it was not forcing a lot of change in schools and having students return to schools that they were not in prior, that type of thing. Um, we've also added a lot of resources the past couple of years, a school nurse in every school, mental health professionals, so on and so forth, that really directly address a lot of the issues that our students were facing as they were coming back from the pandemic. And so are they decisions I would have made myself if I was running the budget? No. Um, and I certainly have expressed concern about infrastructure and um, sustainability. And these are certainly issues that many districts are grappling with across the state and across the country. And, and different districts have different strategies of how they're gonna deal with next year. Some are hoping states are gonna step up. I certainly hope the Commonwealth here um, gets more aggressive in uh, funding the obligations that they have committed to. Regardless if they do or not, we are going to have some challenges. But I agreed with the approach, or I supported the approach. Again, it may not have been one I would have done, but I had supported the approach that we were going to sustain school schools under the theory of less change for our students as they were coming back. Um, I am also keenly aware that this is our superintendent's first budget. And um, she has promised us that this is a transition budget. I shouldn't say promise, I should say has stated repeatedly, this is a transition budget. Um, the school leaders that I have talked to have supported this budget. The parents that I've talked to are supportive of this budget. And that is very important to me. Um, I also, you know, we've had some real interesting data and analysis come on our district in the past several months, the, particularly the data study that we just most recently received, but the other three studies. And we have talked with the superintendent at these meetings about the seriousness of purpose around those, the change that it will require and how she is beginning to fund recommendations from all of those reports in this budget. And I support that. Um, I also support, as was brought up, we are bringing a number of collective bargaining agreements that had expired up to um, basis. So do I um, certainly understand and respect the concerns that have been raised today? Absolutely. And again, as I state, there's room for a range of opinions on this committee, and that's how we all learn from each other. Um, to me, and I've, I have been on this committee for a while and I've had some real difficult votes um, on budgets. And this is not a difficult vote for me. I do have concerns, but I am supportive in the direction, the seriousness of purpose that the superintendent sees the challenges in front of us, the steps she has already taken. Um, and even as I look at, at the central office, for example, I know how much that has been um, pared down in the past few years when we've had to make very difficult decisions of when we've been making cuts after cuts after cuts, years after years, it is always aired on protect the schools and cut more with central office. And we hired a superintendent with deep experience in this district who had been a teacher, had been a school founder and a school leader, had been head of high schools, understood our district deeply, has now put in place an organizational structure with a regional approach that is built on success because we've seen it work in one region of the city. And I trust and believe and support the superintendent when she says, this is what I believe I have to do in central office to be able to support the schools adequately. And the feedback I'm getting from school leaders on that is positive. And so, um, 
I do support this budget. And I think it is important as a matter of uh, support for our superintendent and a message back to uh, the rest of the district. That's that's why I'm why I'm proactively saying I support this and and again respect and appreciation for my fellow members and the concerns they've raised. And I think it will be interesting. You know, this vote is not about um, the trans dev recommendation. This vote is just on the budget. We will be having a separate vote on that. So, you know, we'll continue a conversation there. Um, but respect for the for the conversation, um, and I will be supporting this budget. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you. I know that. Um, We've all thought about this very deeply, that there are things that we all agree about and there are things that we're all concerned about. Um, but I too, um, similar to Mr. O'Neill, and maybe because I get a chance to spend a bit more time with the superintendents that, than most, um, I know we've had hard conversations about things in this budget but also about things that we desperately need to do differently in this district. Um, you know, we're coming through several hard years um, and the superintendent has inherited everything that she has had to deal with and make do with since she's come on board. Um, this is her first budget and it's an opportunity to undo some things that need to be undone, put in place others at the same time dealing with the reality that um, we're coming off of pandemic and ESSER money. And um, you just can't rip off band-aids. Um, we're trying to build a system that can work moving forward. I'd share many of the concerns that you do, um, you know, ab about whether, you know, and how we shift schools, combine schools, close schools, any number of things. There's a lot of important, clear information that we've all been asking for. And I feel as we move forward, that is something we can get. I also have come to understand that the, the vote we make on this budget today and the budget that we open schools with in September often are very, very different. Um, you know, this is the first step in a much longer budget process, but it's the beginning of that process. And I have to trust that the things that the superintendent um, has put before us and the critical issues and changes that need to be made, we need to start here. Um, what I hope will be different this year than in other years that this will not be the last conversation we have about this budget. Um, we've talked about wanting to have a budget task force moving forward so that as we approach fiscal year 24-25, it won't, we won't start these, we will not be starting the conversations next February. We will be looking at everything that happens with this budget as we move towards that so that the budget um, season for schools that starts in the, in the fall will be based on information that we're gathering and on the reality of the problems that we are facing and are concerned now. So all of those concerns we need to put back on the table to make sure that we are getting those issues addressed as we look at this budget to make sure that we are actually able to accomplish with this budget that superintendent has set forth. So for me this evening, I also want to support this budget, but as I say, hold us accountable moving forward. Not coming back to this first time in February, but, you know, but setting up something that means that each month or every quarter, however we decide to do it, we will be looking at and making adjustments as necessary um, as we look at what is happening. So are there any other, I think, uh, Mr. Mady, you have your hand raised. Do you wanna go ahead um, before we, yeah, go ahead. As uh, Mr. Cardat Hernandez said earlier, is it possible by any stretch of the imagination, maybe this is my naivety talking, that we could extend this a week? Because I know we have to present it to the city council and it's not until like a month, give or take. And I'm, 
I know it may not be possible, but and in that case, you you kind of have to pass it if it's not possible. Mm-hmm. Reason being, mm-hmm. what it reverts back to is just yeah, a it's okay. But like, I'm just asking. Two, all right, two things. Let me explain. Um, first, we we, we want to take the vote. Number one. Number two is the charter says we must take a vote today. So we must take a vote. Let's take the vote. Let's see where the vote lands. And then I can clarify that it does not revert back to the first budget that we saw. It it, it reverts to the last budget that was presented, which is the budget that the superintendent actually presented last week. So it's basically the same budget that we are going to vote on one way or the other. So we have to, we're going to vote on the budget as presented, the 1,445,729,446 dollars as presented. That is the same budget that the superintendent um, submitted to us last week. So that's what we'll be voting on. And you know, if the vote does not go through, then that is the budget that we have this point, but let's take the vote and then we can take the next step after that. I know it doesn't quite make sense and it's different than the understanding that we had originally, but we did go out to clarify what that was. And if I am speaking out of turn or if I've misspoken, um, Superintendent or Mr. O'Neill, if you need to correct what I've just said, please either step in to confirm or clarify. Madam Chair, I'll just add for Mr. Meta's sake, um, Mr. Meta, in our in our bylaws, or actually the charter that's set up, it calls for us to take action by the fourth Wednesday of March. And so today is the fourth Wednesday of March. Okay, cool. That's after 613. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question then? Certainly. In that definition of the charter, it then essentially renders this vote somewhat meaningless because if you vote which is why it doesn't make sense to me like if you vote tonight and it doesn't go through it still goes through then why would we why are we voting what is our governing power as a body around the budget my understanding of it would then be if it doesn't go through in this vote which I suspect it's going to go through. I just think we're not, I I just worry we're not being totally intellectually honest here. If it doesn't go through, we still have time before a budget is presented on the deadline it needs to be presented to the council to bring a budget forward. It may revert back to the last presentation and we're working off of that, but we still are working off of a budget to present. Okay, all right. So let's do this. Let's take the vote and see where we land. And then if we need to clarify it more, then we will get that clarification. I've got to get clarification from council um, just to make sure I'm giving you exactly the right word. Is that okay with everyone? No. No, it's not. Okay. No, it's not. Where are we? Wait a minute. Mr. Tron has his hand raised. And then I believe Dr. Alkins wants to. No, you're okay. Okay, Mr. Tron. Um, I'm calling upon the superintendent, superintendent or the uh, CFO to put in, put, you know, the, the, give a, a, a clear ex, uh, explanation if we don't get the vote today. Is it going to re- revert back to the same same uh, budget that, that you uh, proposed last week? So if that is the case, then what is the vote? That is the same thing that that that, that I have that that I I, I hear Mr. Hernandez raise. If that is the case, so what's the importance of the vote? I understand I'm a lawyer, but I understand differently. But I would like to hear it a, a, a little more yes. at, uh, on 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 the nooks and crannies of this. Yeah. I've read I've read the the bylaw. I've read the charter. And I understand it uh, differently, yes. But I want to make sure that it it is coming out at this point, 
as as clear as possible, maybe from uh, Mr. Kuda. Thank you. Ms. Mackey has joined us. Good and evening, Chair, members okay. of this committee. Uh, I, I can hopefully help clarify the question this evening regarding the school committee's vote. The school committee is required under the charter to take a definitive action on the proposed budget recommended by the superintendent. Uh, that is a vote of approval. That is a vote of rejection. Uh, there is no, there's nothing in the charter that says that if the school committee were to reject the budget, it would still go to the city council. Uh, I think that that would be, at least for me, a matter of first impression if the school committee were to reject the vote tonight, but it certainly would not lead to the budget being presented to the city council as if it was not taken action on. The only way that the uh, budget goes to the school, goes to the mayor to be presented to the school committee is that if it is approved or the school committee does not take action by this evening. Just to clarify, does that mean it reverts back to the first budget? I don't understand what you mean by the first budget. The original budget, uh, present the original budget. Because all I'm hearing is what all I'm hearing is words I don't understand. So, so, so the superintendent is required to recommend a budget to the school committee by a certain date in February. After that, the superintendent can modify, increase, reduce, or amend the budget during the budget hearings before the school committee takes a vote. At this moment in time, the budget before the school committee to vote on is the last budget presented by the superintendent, which was what was presented last week. It does not revert back if it were to be rejected to the initial budget. There, is, there will be no approved budget to move forward. There's no budget at all. Is that, does that answer your question? Which, Ms. Mackey, can I ask one more question then? Which yes. that means we would be working, ideal, arguably, we wouldn't leave the system without a budget. We would be working to get to a budget that we approve that we would then bring forward to the council. I have not had an opportunity to fully dive into what would happen if the school committee were to take definitive action in the sense of a, of a rejection of the, of the budget this evening and what would happen thereafter. Um, I don't feel comfortable opining on that at this very moment. If it gets to that, um, I will have to do my best. Um, but if the school committee does not take an action either to approve or to reject, it goes forward to the mayor as if no action was taken at all. Does that, I, I wish I could be more clear. It, it requires a lot of um, review of special legislation to confirm what, what my general opinion would be. Um, I just wanna make sure that I'm absolutely certain that it's the right answer and it's, um, difficult to give hypothetical answers, legal answers to hypothetical questions. It, for, as a member, I'm just saying, because last week's, we got, a, we were left with, I think, a very different message around this too. What was that? It's hard. I just think it's hard. It's hard to vote for something where you don't know what the power of your vote is. I mean, and so it's just, an. I mean, there's like, a, this, part of this is a little bit embarrassing, right? Like we're having this conversation about like what our vote means and we don't know and we won't know. And so it moves to the place of like, you vote yes, because you don't know what happens if you vote no. And so, and that's not a you problem, Mackie, that's probably an us problem. Well, um, I can do this. If there is a no vote tonight, there is no budget to be presented to the mayor for a vote by the city council. What happens in between the no vote and the city council's required hearing um, to 
the set of budget for the school department is, is probably a procedural question that I just want to spend a little bit more time getting a, a certain answer for you. But I can tell you that if the school committee rejects the budget this evening by vote, it does not go forward to the mayor for pre presentation to the school committee. If it votes in favor of the budget, it does. If it takes no action, it then goes forward automatically. So the only way the vote doesn't matter is if the school committee doesn't take it. All right. So we need to take the vote. Yeah, I don't think that that was, yeah, I don't think that that was the, the concern at all. I think we just wanted to know for yeah, me, particular, well, particularly if there was, like if there was to be a, a rejection, what happens between now and May 1st? Is there a time period where we can actually meet and then either amend or do whatever we need to the budget to reach an agreement? I think that was more or less like my question. Um, and thank, thank you, Ms. Matthew, for that. Thank you. I understand the question. And like I said, I'm, I'm fairly confident that there would be a, a time that there could be another budget proposed, but I don't know what the authority of the school committee would be after the definitive action is a rejection beyond the state of tonight. Like I said, it's a matter of first impression and difficult to answer in this forum. Oh, thank you. Anyway, Mr. Tran? Yes. I have before me the, uh, the language of the bylaw. Section two of the bylaw regarding the budget, the, the, our, our responsibilities in, uh, under Article 6. I'm going to, okay. Section three, the school committee exercise, okay. It's fiscal responsibility, okay. The part regarding, I, I just fail to, I just fail to see how the legal department cannot have a definitive answer regarding this. This is a very important, important vote that we have to take and there's there, there is no clear guideline here is the guideline and i guess you know we we have to take it from 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 the express language of of, uh, of the bylaw the school committee may adopt reject reduce or increase any item however if it fails to act by the fourth wednesday of march in march the annual budget as recommended by the superintendent will be deemed approved by the school committee and will be submitted by the superintendent to the, the mayor. Okay. And then at that point, the mayor may approve or reduce the total recommended budget. So if my understanding is correct, if we don't vote today, whatever the budget that was originally or, or at this point, um, uh, if we don't vote today, the budget will be submitted in a way, but it will rest, the responsibility will then rest on the mayor to either reduce or approve. That's what I, I read. Is there anything? So the important, the, in my mind, the importance of voting today is the fact that if we don't vote, the budget goes to the mayor, the mayor can do whatever he or she wants. That is correct. What, what I understand the question to me to be is if the school committee takes definitive action tonight, which is a vote of rejection, what happens then? You're, you're on mute, Mr. Khan. Mr. Tran, you're on mute. That's all I need to say. I, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we, we, if we, we don't if we don't vote or we reject it, or we vote to reject it, the the same budget going to go to the mayor. The mayor will have the, the the sole authority to either approve it or reduce it according to you know to whatever she he or she deems fit. 
So the vote is important in the sense that, you know, if we voted today that as, as it is, then, then, then the budget will be approved the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go forward with the budget, with the vote. Mr. O'Neill, before I go forward, do you have something? Mr. O'Neill? Just real quick, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate the guidance from council. I will say it is slightly different than guidance that previous councils had supplied to this committee as far as the interpretation of what happens. But I understand and respect the guidance that we have had. So it clearly says, if we are going to take action, we have to take action by the fourth Wednesday in March, which is today. So if we vote yes, it moves forward. If we don't take action, if we just pass on taking a vote, then as Ms. Mackey has explained, it appears to me that uh, the superintendent's most recent recommendation moves forward. If we vote no, from what I'm hearing from Ms. Mackey, we would, working with the district would have to figure out a new budget between now and May when it goes to the mayor and then to the city council. And I just want to think through for a second the implications of that, because right now we have a budget presented to us that has been planned with school leaders and school communities in effect since December when they first got allocations. So we are not a independent district. We are not a taxing authority. We cannot come up with more revenue, right? We get an allocation from the city, from the state, from the federal government. So we're limited on that. If changes were going to be made to the budget, somehow this would have to be done in a very short order to be able to still have a budget to present to the mayor, to present to the city council. And we would be taking away spending from, since we don't have increased funding, we would be taking away spending from schools that have based budgets and plans and assumptions on what has been laid out to them since December. And um, the superintendent has clearly laid out a budget that aligns with her priorities, aligns with our goals and, and guardrails, aligns with the MOU that we have had with the state and aligns with the recommendations that have been made in um, areas that we're all concerned about. One issue we have all raised is concern over a pending fiscal cliff, but I highly doubt between now and mid-April, we would suddenly come up with a plan and announce a closing of a bunch of schools, if that's what we are concerned about, without community input, without families being involved. You know, Ms. Palenko Garcia put on the table, separate from this, we should have a task force that involve more people to be thinking about these things. I shudder at the thought, uh, while I recognize the concerns raised, I shudder at the thought of how we could possibly think we could come up with an alternative budget between now and say mid-April to be able to present to the mayor to go to the, um, to the city council. So I reiterate my viewpoint that um, I hear the concerns, I think they're raised and most importantly, I think they're heard by the superintendent. And yet I support the uh, budget that she has put on the table that she has told us is a transition budget and is moving us from where we are now, setting us up um, to continue to evolve in the future. And so I appreciate the guidance we've seen from council and particularly in light of the guidance that we have heard from the council that we have to take action one way or another tonight or the budget automatically moves forward. That if our alternative is to either approve this budget or to turn it down, in which case a new budget would have to be figured out in the space of several weeks, I quite frankly can't see how that could possibly happen. And the amount of disruption to our schools, to our school leaders, to our teachers, to our collective bargaining agreements that were based on a number of assumptions, and most importantly to our students and our families without their input is, is um, difficult for me to conceive of. And so I recommend that we uh, approve the budget as presented. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Okay. So there's nothing further. I'll now entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's final fiscal 24 general fund budget recommendation in the amount of 1 billion 445,000 million, sorry, $729,446 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Jesus. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? No. Mr. Credit Hernandez? No. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved with four yeas and two noes. Thank you. I know this was very difficult, but thank you. Our next action item is the 2023 Massachusetts School Building Authority core project statements of interest. You will recall that last week, Chief of Capital Planning, Delaver and Stanislaus presented a request to submit statements of interest for the MSBA's 2023 core program for the PA Shaw and Charles Taylor Elementary Schools. I will now turn it over to the superintendent for final comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Um, it's important that we maximize every resource at our disposal to renovate and build our new schools, um, you know, in the vision that we have for our students and all that they need. Um, the MSBA is a critical partner, as I gave testimony to last week uh, at school committee. And uh, we do believe that, you know, MSBA, as we've seen in the past and, and has been evidenced in um, funding that we've received for various buildings and projects, um, that they really are going to be a key partner in helping us to achieve our goals uh, relative to the Green New Deal uh, for BPS. So I asked the committee for their vote to move the application forward for the Shars and for the Shar and the Taylor. Um, and I, I thank you for the feedback on the budget. Uh, we will take that under strong consideration as we look at um, going forward with it. Um, and uh, would ask for your um, approval and uh, support with the vote for the MSBA projects. Thank you. I'll now open it up to the committee for final questions and comments. Okay. Are there any questions? Dr. Alkins? Um, yes, just throughout this process, what would you say are some of the learn, the best learned practices that we can take forward as we're thinking about other school mergers? Um, three, two, yeah. So I think I, I would sort of separate that into two pieces. I think one is the actual MSBA project uh, plan. And um, I think, you know, we've had three different meetings with MSBA over the course of the last several weeks. Um, to be able to um, sort of talk about Green New Deal and be able to talk about from a, a big picture of BPS, um, you know, what that's going to mean for our community. Uh, I think it also gave us an opportunity and particularly our uh, newly formed, uh, you know, capital planning department um, with Chief Stanislaus to be able to hear about the process and how best we can respond to the process um, in a way to represent fully the needs of whatever project it is that we're putting forward. So in this case, the Sharon Taylor. Um, and so I, I think that's been a, a good learning process for us. And so we're eager, um, you know, in this particular one to uh, to be able to meet the April deadline. Uh, and I think we feel as a whole between facilities um, and between the capital planning office, um, we feel far more prepared um, in the to enter into the process. I think on the community side, you know, that um, one of the things we've sort of seen from at least from the beginning of the year was uh, the need to create a department, not just um, have this have the whole uh, idea of mergers or closures or consolidations be folded into facilities because it's a much bigger um, you know solution set that needs to happen, a, lot, a much broader stakeholder group. 
that needs to come together to support the work. Um, it cannot just fall as an entity within facilities because their work on a daily basis is very different. I think we've responded to that. And I think that has been the creation of capital planning. It has been taking someone in Dell who has been very successful um, in his work with the community around transportation um, and the stakeholders within BPS um, to make some really good progress over the last several years um, in moving a large system in BPS forward. And so I think our, our hope and our belief is that Dell with uh, her staff will be able to do the same with Green New Deal work um, in, in the capital planning. We'll be able to work in partnership with MSBA as we put forward um, you know, these, these projects for consideration and hopefully are granted it. Um, and, and to be able to do the strategic work that lies ahead, um, namely with all of the reports uh, that we will be getting back between the facilities conditions, the BPS master facility plan, and then the, the site work of the pre-K um, to six and the seven to 12 design work. So again, there's lots of information that's going to be coming in over the next 12 months. Um, and I do feel confident that Dell and her team, along with the stakeholders across our departments, are in a much better place to be able to, to position that work, and most importantly, to involve the community. And I think that's, you know, that's really what we spoke about um, early on with the merges that had been proposed at the end of last year, that that infrastructure was not in place. And the recognition that it really is a community process that we need to keep um, iterating and, um, and changing and improving was not there. Um, that I think, you know, is at the crux in listening to the last conversation, the idea that we could somehow rush forward um, in a very short amount of time and put a series of mergers or consolidations or closures on the table is in direct conflict with the testimony we've heard together as a body from all of the families and community members that have come before us. So I do feel going forward that the healthy process we're adopting and it's not perfect, we are still learning in the process, we are still listening to our families, will be the one that we need to do as over the next several years, we accelerate this work. Not that we leave the community behind, but rather that we do it with the community. So um, those are, I think, are a few of the lessons learned, Dr. Alkins. Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Thank you. And Superintendent, thanks for sitting through um, that messy conversation. <laughs> um, I guess my question here is, Given um, if I am tracking this right, that the MSBA denied the last three projects, mm -hmm. um, if they're like, how serious are we about this? Like, are, is there a commitment to put the money for this Shaw Taylor build into the fiscal year 24, 25 capital budget in case MSBA denies us in December. I'm just thinking we asked about Blackstone and Otis and <laughs> the other school last time and we didn't talk about, so we were like sort of what's next, but I'm sort of curious, like how serious are we about this? And like, if so, are we willing to sort of say we're, we're so serious and this just helps our vote tonight, like that we're gonna apply for MSBA and this is, will eventually make its way into our capital budget in case we don't get it. Cause I, that's not the certainty the other communities had, you know? Sure, so I, I can't but, obviously speak on behalf of the, the city side with the capital um, and the Green New Deal funding. But what I can say is that there has definitely been a commitment to go back and revisit the projects now that have not been funded, that have been previously put in for application. So I think that's a very positive sign. I think the other thing I would say is that we're sitting in a very different position in submitting the Shaw Taylor than we were when we were submitting the Blackstone in the previous projects. MSBA made it very clear that they're responsible for the Commonwealth. And as such, there's only so many projects that can be going in a district, even the size of Boston, before it starts to really complicate their ability to serve the Commonwealth. I, I think since that time, uh, BAA has been completed and come off the table. Dearborn has been completed and come off the table. And Quincy has had, Quincy Upper has had a raising of the beam signaling a, a progress in that in that project. So I think we're in a, a different spot than we were before. I think we're very hopeful about the Shaw Taylor. Um, but I also think that these are, you know, there's no guarantee anytime you're putting in one of these projects. Um, what we had, what I think our goal in meeting with MSBA was, was to really understand how applications are looked at and what is the technical support that's available so that we can make sure as we put these projects in, we're putting our best foot forward, we're expressing 
the priority and the reason for the priority of the Shaw Taylor um, and the critical work that we believe needs to be done in that building and, and as to why. Um, so I think we we feel good as a team that that application that will go in in April has, you know, uh, as, as good a chance as, as any at this point, um, which is different than when you've already got three or four projects actively being funded by MSBA. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions, comments? If nothing further, I'll now entertain a motion to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Board Authority the statements of interest for the PA Shaw and Charles Taylor Elementary Schools as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Our next action item is the TransDev Yellow Bus Transportation Contract. <coughs> you will recall that last week, Executive Director of Transportation, Dan Rosengard, presented the superintendent's recommendation to approve the yellow bus vendor contract between Boston Public Schools and TransDev Services Incorporated for an initial five-year term commencing on July 1st, 2023. I'll now turn it over to the superintendent for final comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to just start off by thanking Dan, Jack, Jackie, Mike, and the whole team um, for all of their hard work uh, for literally what has been two years um, worth of a process to get to this point um, to what we believe will better serve students. BPS transportation requires systemic change. I think we're clear on that. The Council of Great City Schools made that crystal clear to us. But they also made clear that our complex system will require years of consistent progress with gains made every day. Um, it's taken our system a long time to have it be the way it is, and it's going to take some time in order, even with that systemic change, to get it to where we want it to be. Um, the five-year contract, uh, vendor contract proposed tonight, it's an important uh, part of the consistent progress that's required, as, as we believe it. Um, it provides us the time and the stability to assess our needs, implement changes, and continue to build on the improvements that we've been making. The contract's been entirely restructured to focus on vendor accountability, and it's tied to financial incentives based on outcomes for students. And that's a vastly different type of contract than has been served up in the past year. TransDev's demonstrated an ability and a commitment to improve, especially in recent years, working in partnership with us to try at each step to fix things that are not working, to better systems and to, to really try to think about what systems change looks like. Through their bid, TransDev is committed to continued improvements as well as taking on the fiscal responsibility associated with non-performance. Over the past few months, BPS and TransDev have worked closely to finalize an agreed upon contract and prepare for a smooth and successful implementation. We pre appreciate their continued partnership and I think in order to keep us on the right path, I respectfully request a yes vote on tonight's transportation vendor contract. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll now open it up to the committee for final questions and comments. Are there any final comments? Okay, there's nothing further. I'll now entertain a motion to approve the yellow bus vendor contract between Boston Public Schools and TransDev Services for an initial five year term commencing on July 1st, 2023 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cadet Hernandez? With hesitation, but yes. Ms. Lopera? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Abstem. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved with five yeses and one abstain. Thank you. Our first report this evening is tentative collective bargaining agreements with the Boston School Police Superior Officers Federation and the Lunch Hour Monitors Association. Before I turn it over to Labor Relations Director Jeremiah Hassan, I want to invite the superintendent to give introductory remarks. I'd also like to remind everyone to please speak at a slower pace for to assist our interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I just want to thank our team and Jeremiah for all the work. I think as we've shared with the committee and appreciate their support, we're trying very hard to get our all of our labor contracts current and into the future. Um, I think both of these contracts, I'd like to uh, to thank both unions. Um, I think they represent, um, you know, forward progress in uh, both making the current the contract current. Um, one of the contracts brings us up through the end of this year, and then we will um, begin in early spring with uh, continued negotiation. Uh, and in the other case, it brings us through 2024. Um, I think both of them, uh, you know, reflect uh, an appreciation for um, for the members work during the pandemic years um, and certainly in the work that they do every day for our children. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Jeremiah to uh, present the contracts. Thank you, Superintendent and Madam Chair, committee members. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I'm excited to present to you two agreements as Superintendent Skipper mentioned. Uh, the first, I'll start with the superior offices, which Superintendent Skipper mentioned is a four year deal that'll cover us through the 2023-24 school year. Uh, it's actually two separate agreements. The first agreement is a one year uh, fully retroactive agreement covering the fiscal year uh, 2021 uh, and it's wages only, it's a 2% increase uh, for that year. So that's one separate contract. And then the second MOA is a three year contract from uh, fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 24, uh, expiring on June 30th, 2024. Uh, and it follows the consistent pattern that we've seen with some of our other bargaining units of 2.5% general wage increases uh, and a one-time lump sum payment of $1,000 for those members who are active during fiscal year 22. Uh, the other financial benefits include an increase in the stipend for CPR certification, uh, from $600 to $750 uh, uh, on an annual basis. Uh, in addition to the financial benefits, the parties agreed to some language changes. They include clarification of the uniforms for members of this unit, uh, updating the holiday language, and this is the updates that you've seen in other bargaining units that were presented and have voted Please on and approved. So oh, down. Sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yeah, so... The update to the holiday language is consistent to other contracts that were pre presented already uh, and have been approved. They include changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day and expanding the options for using uh, time for religious observances beyond those traditional holidays that previously uh, identified by name in the contract. So now observers of non-traditional holidays can take time off without losing pay. Um, in, in addition to those benefits, uh, there is some, a change in the minimum required time for overtime. So employees uh, of this unit who are called in to work overtime will have a minimum of three hours now under this new language that we've agreed upon. Uh, so that's the basic highlights of the agreement. Uh, do you have any, any questions? Um, as Superintendent Skipper mentioned, we think this is a, a fair deal. Uh, we appreciated the partnership with the Superior Officers Federation to get this done. Uh, and on behalf of the bargaining team, we recommend the vote to approve this agreement. Thank you. I'll open it up to the committee for any questions.
Anyone? No, nope, I think we're fine. And um, we look forward to taking action on this okay. at our April 12th meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the second contract uh, tentative agreement that I'm presenting to you is with our lunch hour monitors. Uh, as Superintendent Skipper mentioned, this deal runs through just the end of this school year. So it's almost fully retroactive. It's a three-year deal going back to fiscal year 21. Uh, mm -hmm. Similarly to the superior officers, it calls for a 2% general wage increase in fiscal year 21, uh, a 2.5% increase in fiscal year 22, and a 2.5% increase in fiscal year 23. That's the current year. Um, Additionally, there is a one-time $1,000 bonus for those members who are active during the 21-22 school year. Uh, this is a, a wages only straightforward deal. As Superintendent Skipper mentioned, uh, we'll be back to the bargaining table with this group uh, almost immediately to look forward to, to maybe a different, uh, more substantive changes uh, if necessary in the next round of bargaining. Thank you. Are there any questions? Nope, I think everyone's okay. We had a good session earlier, so thank you. And we look forward to taking action in this on the April 12th meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me just take this time to thank our bargaining partners with both groups. Uh, the negotiations with both groups went very smooth and were efficient. Uh, and we hope that that continues moving forward, especially with the lunch hour monitors as we'll be back to the table with them very soon. So. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our main report this evening is chronic absenteeism and district improvement strategies. Before I turn it over to Brian Mark, Senior Director, BPS Department of Opportunity Youth and April Clarkson, BPS Director of Research, I want to invite the superintendent to give introductory remarks. I'd also like to remind everyone to please speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to say I'm very excited about um, this is this is a great, a great topic for us to dig into tonight. Um, but before we begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge um, just that the graduation and dropout data uh, came out recently and there's a deep connection to the crucial work that we're doing um, to address chronic absenteeism oh, and Lord. the dropout pipeline. Um, Desi uh, publicly uh, released the 2022 graduation and dropout data rates earlier this month. Due to the cancellation of MCAS testing in the spring of 2020, so this was pandemic, um, most graduates in the 2022 cohort did not receive their competency determination through MCAS testing. In other words, having a, a, a needs improvement with a plan or a proficient um, to, uh, on the tests. Uh, instead, they, they uh, received a certificate for graduation through what we call a modified competency determination process. And this has to do with them taking particular courses that by passing those courses, um, they receive, um, the, uh, we, we have an understanding that they have the competency. As a result, Boston experienced a 2.2 percentage point increase in the four year cohort graduation rate. So it went from 78.8% for the 2021 graduation cohort to 81% for the 2022 graduation cohort. All student groups and 17 schools experienced a significant increase in the graduation rate for 2022. Unfortunately, um, the district, along with others across the state and nation, continue to struggle with student engagement in the 2021-2022 school year, and the annual dropout rate in BPS increased by about 1.7 percentage points. So it went from 2.0 to 3.7. And that was a trend that we saw across the nation and, and the state. This, this dropout increase was seen by all student groups, um, really with the exception of students who identify as multi-race, non-Latinx. That was the only group, and it's a smaller cohort. The increased dropout rate was most greatly experienced, 
and this is something that we have to pay a lot of attention to by our English learner students who had a dropout rate of 7.1%, which represented 226 students. So that, that is a particular group that we have to concentrate with strategies on so that they're not dropping out going forward uh, and that we can re-engage them. As the district continues to implement increased controls on withdrawal documentation, and to re remind everybody, this was our most recent DESE audit that Ernest Young performed, and it was specifically around how we withdraw students and the documentation we do or do not collect as part of that process. Um, because we're in the process now of using an appropriate process requiring documentation to withdraw our students, we can expect to likely see an increase in the dropout rate and a decrease in the graduation rate until systems are fully functioning and our re-engagement and support efforts have taken hold. So I continue to say this to prepare everyone because in the original data, they looked at, you know, ex, uh, say out of 100 records, about 80% of them did not have the level of documentation for withdrawal that the state requires. So the efforts that, that this means we have to accelerate our efforts because, relative to re-engagement um, and support, both because our dropout rate is going up and because there's likely more effect of it going up as we actually do the data process correctly. So some of these that we've already taken as steps, um, a change in the re-engagement center where they're visiting, instead of having students have to come to them, um, they are out in the schools, they're visiting our larger schools, they're meeting with students at the home school, and they're starting the referral process there with students and families. Um, the first round of just that one switch yielded 41 new referrals to other kinds of educational options for our students who were in the process of dropping out by not coming to school, disengaged, low grades. But because of that process, we now have them in an ed option that's gonna allow them to continue and get back on track. We're in the process of doing another round of that right now. And we're, as part of this budget, expanding educational options or what we call alternative education um, and creating seats and new career training programs, all thinking about the students, where they are, who they are and what they need. We're also currently addressing the increased dropout rate um, with a concentrated effort in the schools around student support bringing in nonprofit and community partners to work with our most vulnerable students and lots of constant communication between home, school, and student. I wanna thank Chief Kelton, Ted Lombardi, who's our high school, school superintendent, um, Emmanuel Allen, or Manny, um, who directs the re-engagement center, uh, Carlos Diaz, who oversees our alternative and uh, programming and educational options, and Brian Marks, who you'll hear from shortly, um, because all of them as a team share the same passion to make sure we re-engage our students who have dropped out, but more importantly, that we, we really have enough supports in place that students don't have to get to the point of dropping out. So at that point, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna pass it over to Brian and I'm happy to take questions um, as part of the presentation when Brian has concluded. Uh, so Brian? All right, thank you so much, Superintendent Skipper, uh, Chair Robinson, and the members of the school committee for the opportunity to present this evening. Just bear with me a moment here.
Okay, so tonight, what I'd like to be able to do is provide an overview of where we are across the district in terms of our chronic absenteeism rate, including uh, a breakdown across key demographic groups, but also share some of the district improvement strategies that we have in place and the key initiatives that we view as critical to success as it comes to reducing chronic absenteeism. So for a little background and context, chronic absenteeism is defined as students who miss 10% or more school days for any given time period. This is a key metric in BPS in the state of Massachusetts, as well as nationally across school districts, because we know that all missed instructional time can have a detrimental impact on student learning, student outcomes. Um, chronic absenteeism includes both excused and unexcused absences. For a full school year in BPS, that would equate to 18 absences. Since the pandemic, uh, the onset of the pandemic, we have seen a spike. So chronic absenteeism has really become a district, state, and national crisis. Here with this uh, line graph, you can see that historically, the BPS chronic absenteeism rate, which is represented in blue, tracks um, in a very parallel way with the statewide rate, albeit at a higher rate. Since the pandemic in 2020, we've started to see a huge increase in the chronic absenteeism rate. So this is both in BPS as of last year, where we were uh, above 42% of students were chronically absent, as well as at the state rate, which was nor uh, nearly 28%. Nationally, since uh, the start of the pandemic, nearly uh, 2 million additional students are chronically absent. However, we are really starting to see some progress. Uh, we're starting to see trends in the right direction. So here you can see uh, a bar graph where uh, each bar represents a school across the district, with, with the exception of the uh, district-wide change represented in light blue, uh, and then the change for transformation schools that we see in dark blue. So the majority of schools, as of this time uh, last year, compared with where we are in the current school year, have seen a decrease in their chronic absenteeism rate. So this is very encouraging. You can see that transformation schools in particular, which is a major focus of our efforts, have had uh, a larger increase than the, or larger decrease, excuse me, than we have seen across the district overall. Of course, a decrease in chronic absenteeism is a good thing. So each uh, bar here represents an individual school. Um, 96 schools have experienced a reduction in chronic absenteeism rates. Um, and again, overall, the district uh, has seen a decrease of nearly 8% with comparison to uh, this time last school year. Here we can see um, a stacked uh, bar graph where um, in blue, these are the students who are not chronically absent, so they have uh, an attendance rate above 90%. Um, in yellow, we see students who are chronically absent in the range of uh, 80 per, uh, above 80% and at or below 90%. And then in orange, we have an attendance rate above 60% and at or below 80%. In red, um, these are students who have an attendance rate below 60%. So you can see um, overall, we have higher rates of chronic absenteeism in our transformation schools. Um, District-wide year-to-date, we're seeing that 35% of students are chronically absent. That's in comparison to where we ended up last year, which was above 42%. So again, we're starting to see some progress with the initiatives that we have in place. Um, the rates are higher, again, for transformation schools. Um, among racial and ethnic groups, we see that Latinx and Native students have the highest rates of chronic absenteeism. When we look at uh, grade ranges and age ranges, this is also a, a key metric. So when you look at the state law as it relates to attendance, um, students are not required to go to school uh, before the first grade. However, the research knows, and we all know as educators and, and those of us in the community, 
that that early childhood education opportunity is so critical for the long-term learning outcomes and opportunities for a young person. So we want to do everything possible to make sure that our, our youngest students are in school consistently every day. But we do see that we have higher rates of chronic absenteeism among our students in the K0 to K2 grade band. Uh, we also start to see an increase in chronic absenteeism at the high school level. So these are two key focus areas in terms of our broader efforts overall. Um, and then if you look at the ages specifically, we see uh, similar um, trends where students who are uh, below the age of six have higher chronic absenteeism, and then students uh, above the age of 16 that's the age with which um, legally students can drop out of school. Um, for those of you who have been on the school committee for some time, know that we actually have a particular provision in our attendance policy that still requires uh, engagement with the parent, uh, caregiver, or guardian um, if a student is uh, looking to make that decision. And we also have a process to utilize the re-engagement center to explore other educational opportunities for that student so that we can prevent dropouts to the greatest extent possible. We also see um, among our economically disadvantaged students, so this is a, a particularly vulnerable um, student group, they have higher chronic absenteeism rates compared to our non-economically disadvantaged students. Um, among English learners, uh, current English learners have uh, higher chronic absenteeism rates Although former English learners, we see it is lower than the district uh, or the not in comparison to non English learners. Um, we also see that uh, students with an IEP, so students who are in special education, have higher chronic absenteeism rates compared with students with without an IEP. I'd now like to transition and share some of the initiatives and uh, improvement strategy strategies that we have in place. So in terms of our guiding principles, the school attendance structure is really critical in terms of how we deliver this work. So we work directly with schools to help them establish effective school attendance teams. Part of this is building strong school-based prevention and intervention strategies by tier. So we're, we're looking beyond just your traditional attendance interventions like phone calls home, home visits, attendance meetings. Those certainly are essential and critical to our work, but we also recognize that the tiered systems that, that impact attendance beyond traditional interventions include culture and climate, health and well being, and general attendance awareness and how that connects to educational outcomes. Um, another guiding principle is the importance of consistent attendance outreach and intervention practices. Relationship mapping is essential to the work that we are doing in helping schools to build their processes and procedures to better understand which students in the school have strong relationships with staff members. How can you utilize and mobilize those staff members to have more intentional outreach and deeper connections with families? And then if you if you identify students that don't have deep relationships in the school, school community, who can um, be accessed in the school community among the educators or among community partners that can help to deepen that level of engagement so that we don't start to see disconnection, which we know ultimately can increase uh, dropouts. Uh, consistent follow-up is also a, a key piece. Um, it creates a level of engagement and accountability. So using the concept of a nudge approach that we'll talk about a little further, historically, just in general, and not only in BPS, uh, a lot of the approaches around attendance and absenteeism have been punitive in nature. And our focus now is really on building those relationships, developing a sense of belonging among all students, among all families, and making sure that school is a safe and welcoming place that students want to be every day, and our parents and caregivers want to send their children every day. Um, qual the quality school plan or the QSP is also the fundamental guiding document that we work from uh, across our regional model that we will touch on uh, in a moment. So we are working through a regional model to better support schools. Each school has a quality school plan. Attendance is one of the priorities in the school the quality school plan, as well as culture and climate, of course. Um, 
uh, instructional equity. So what we have is a document that helps to guide collaboration across functional groups at central office, but more importantly, to help increase, increase the level of effectiveness and cross-functional collaboration at the school level. And part of the work that we're doing on an ongoing basis is to help guide schools to refine their, their QSP uh, in 90 day increments, um, to provide, provide feedback and guidance in the areas where they can um, fully implement the vision, where they can close gaps in their practices, and really ensure that each school has a strategic vision and has tangible support in place to reach that vision. So again, the regional model brings together cross-functional groups across a range of areas. So this is everything from social workers to equity specialists, operational leaders, um, human capital support, equitable literacy. Um, and then of course, supervisors of attendance, which falls directly within the Department of Opportunity Youth and is a focus of our attendance work. We are also increasing the capacity to support schools through the regional model. So we will have um, going into the, the coming school year, a supervisor of attendance assigned to each region directly. So there is increased support. Um, there's, a, there's a smaller portfolio of schools per supervisor of attendance. And you know, historically, we've we've presented it within the past couple of years where um, we've changed the approach. We we went to the bargaining table with uh, the teachers union and shifted some of the job responsibilities of supervisors of attendance. So they are focused on working in schools, working with school teams, helping to increase best practices across the district in terms of outreach, engagement, modeling, providing technical assistance, working hand in hand with school attendance teams, and really decreasing the focus on just truancy court as the de facto or default strategy when it comes to absenteeism. The Panorama Student Success Platform is also a critical tool that, that uh, students have had in place for a couple of years now. This allows a collaborative approach where there can be a champion who creates a success plan for a student, but then adds uh, classroom teachers, uh, the school nurse, the guidance counselor, a social worker, a family liaison to all participate and contribute and update the plan with interventions to identify uh, early indicators of students that are falling off track as it relates to attendance. Attendance is uh, one of the most important early indicators because it can also often be a, so a sign that something else is happening in a student's life that is preventing them from attending school every day. That can be something that's happening in the school environment. It can be a situation where students feel like they're falling behind academically and don't feel hope that they can get caught up. Sometimes it can be something that's happening at home or in their personal life. But recognizing that when we start to have a decline in attendance among an individual student, that that student will need outreach and support and putting a team together and then monitoring the progress and effectiveness in, of interventions and then changing course as needed, um, which often involves uh, increasing the number of touch points and um, having uh, more interactions with the student and, put, and putting a, a more robust plan in place. The tiered attendance system is something that really complements the Panorama Student Success Platform. Uh, Panorama, in many respects, well, it looks at the, the global view across the district as well as a school-wide view of uh, the overall attendance really the, the value is being able to look at how individual students are doing and focus on interventions, tiered interventions for individual students and then tracking that progress. The tiered attendance system looks at the extent to which schools are consistent and effective across best practices organized within tiers for the entire school. So the process really begins with the schools um, taking a self-assessment. And it gets very granular. And again, we're looking at a range of factors. So health and wellness, joyful and engaging instruction in the classroom, uh, the safe and welcoming uh, school environment, um, the extent to which community partners are at place, mentorship opportunities that might exist within the school. But from there, within a week's time, we provide a result summary 
to the school, and then we schedule a consultation session with their attendance team, members of our department, as well as uh, including the supervisor of attendance. We walk through their results. We highlight where they have strengths, opportunities. We also look at some of their uh, historical chronic absenteeism data. We look at the opportunity index for the school, their panorama usage, how they can improve that. And then we provide recommendations on the areas where they have gaps and give them a realistic and feasible plan that they can work from to implement improvements based on their school capacity and needs. And from there, there's a feedback loop opportunity. So we've had about uh, 42 unique schools who have participated in this process over the past few years. Uh, it's something that we encourage for all schools, uh, but we certainly um, uh, proactively reach out to schools that we see are struggling um, with their attendance to engage them in this process. And now we're starting to see that schools are coming back to take the, um, the needs assessment for a second time and go through the process for a second time because they found so much value in the process. We, we have also adjusted our attendance letters, and this uh, reflects our, an overall shift in our mindset in terms of how we are approaching attendance. So again, historically, our, our, our attendance letters were, were rather punitive in nature and ineffective in reducing chronic absenteeism. We modeled this after um, national research from everyday labs that um, demonstrated in a number of large urban school districts that using nudge theory, or uh, which is rooted in be behavioral science, that uh, this can actually uh, prompt the change and reduction in chronic absenteeism more effectively than um, some of the traditional punitive uh, letters as it relates to attendance. So this is truly an evidence-based approach. This is something that was a collaboration between um, the Office of Data and Accountability, Opportunity Youth, um, as well as our Office of uh, Instructional and Information Technology, OIT. So for folks who have seen, have received uh, an energy bill, an electric bill, where they show a comparison of your energy usage with that of others, this is a very similar concept. So it shows the data in a very transparent way. So other research has shown that when you show data transparently, it helps people to understand the problem. It helps to mobilize action and, and, and really... Um, align people around a common goal and have a common understanding of the need for change. So the language, in addition to showing the data in a very transparent way where that particular student's attendance is shown in comparison to the district or the individual student goal of 94% attendance or above, it also has language that is family centered. It encourages a partnership with the family. It provides tips on how parents, caregivers, and students can improve their attendance so that sometimes that can be habits and practices at home, waking up in the morning, um, having a routine, and so forth. And then it also provides how to get in contact with the school if they uh, need additional help or um, they're looking for resources, as well as just transparently shares the district calendar as well as, well as the report card schedule. Um, some of the more intensive resources that we have. Um, the students have uh, available 75 minute school consultation sessions through a panorama strategic advisor to improve their practices and, and improve their integration of the panorama student success platform. Um, again, we talked about the tiered attendance system, the, the consultative service that we offer through our department, um, through the regional model. Again, we have intensive on site support. The supervisors of attendance are working within the regional teams directly with, with school attendance teams on site. And another key aspect of, is, of, of this that has emerged is the identification of priority schools to, to uh, engage with even uh, more robust and specialized training. So school superintendents um, have been able to identify priority schools in their region for more intensive training. So we've initiated that series. Part of it has been sharing um, some of the best practices and successes and, and effective strategies from similar schools who have come in and presented to the priority schools, as well as dialogues where we openly problem solve across work groups, functional groups, and schools 
And then um, we created an accompanied action plan template to help schools identify gaps in their quality school plan and then provide recommendations on improvements. Um, and that's something that also uh, aligns with some of the work happening with transformation schools, which is another area of focus for our supervisors of attendance and regional teams. The uh, attendance mini grants initiative is an ESSER funded project. Um, we viewed this as an opportunity to really help return from remote learning during the pandemic and reinvigorate and reestablish the strong attendance practices that really shifted by necessity during the pandemic that, that looked very different. Um, schools uh, apl could apply in September of each of the prior two school years um, with funding upwards of $20,000 per school. Um, the, the guidelines that, that schools had in place were specific priority student groups. So these are some of the demographic groups that we've seen higher rates of chronic absenteeism. So developing a project plan or a grant application that would describe how they would implement strategies to uh, reduce chronic absenteeism and, and specifically focus on engagement with those groups, as well as the use of some of the existing BPS tools and resources to uh, accomplish their, their vision. Um, with the current school year, we enhanced this process to um, implement uh, staffing support for implementation and budget management. Uh, we've had 55 unique schools that participated in this process. You can see um, that we had 16 high schools the first year and, and then 15 the second year. Um, we've had uh, about 24 transformation schools, and then uh, we also increased the number of uh, alternative education schools or educational collaborative schools this year, and we had 22 new awardees that didn't uh, receive the grant in the prior year. Of the 35 schools that were awarded an, atten an attendance mini grant for the current school year, 25 have seen a reduction in chronic absenteeism um, from the prior year. Of these, 19 had a reduction of at least 5%, and eight had a reduction of 10% or more. And with that, I will turn it back to Chair Robinson and I'll allow any questions that there might folks might have. Thank you. I'll open it up for questions. Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Just sort of a basic question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, as we're looking at chronic absenteeism, are we surveying students? And maybe this is different than the sort of climate survey. I'm looking sort of individually at kids to understand what's pulling them from school. So we have been doing that, but it's been more of an inorganic um, approach and not necessarily sort of a like formal focus group approach. So we, before the, uh, in um, 2020, uh, the fall of 2020, or excuse me, the, the fall of 2019, before the onset of the pandemic, we actually did um, organize <coughs> a uh, student attendance forum. Um, where we brought together students across a range of high schools to gather their input and insights, which helped to sort of formulate the vision that we now have in place. Um, <laughs> some of our current work has involved uh, having ongoing dialogues with students. Um, we've had a lot more involvement, for instance, with the Boston Student Advisory Council, so engaging students around um, you know, their thoughts on the overall school environment, the culture and climate, the, the safety and well-being, and, and their feelings about that. So um, that's some of the work that we've done directly in our department. It's exciting. And Superintendent, this, I'm sure you're thinking about this as it's going, right? Like, this is interesting, real hard data, less the sort of the mm -hmm. anecdotal sort of stories and more like, what are the things that are pulling our young people during this crisis? Yeah. Is it jobs? Is it illness? Is it caretaking for a family member? Is it taking care of a sibling? Is it disengagement just like the school is yeah. no bueno and I don't want to be there, right? Like, but if we have better information, then we can develop programming around it. Like, I suspect there is like a, you know, you hear me talk about this all the time. Like, I suspect 
there is a big chunk of our young people who are working and picking up hours during the school day. And so like, how do we compete with that market? How are we creating work study jobs at school or like doing things that are innovative to be like, no, this is a place that can also employ you. Or is it about caretaking? And then we are helping families tap into our threes and fours programming or just like if we have that, we can deploy the resources smarter if we know in, in sort of more real numbers what where the demand is yeah so i think one of the one of the really important processes and structures that we've worked hard on is the student support teams um and we didn't talk as much about them tonight but they're the ones using panorama they're the ones like at noticing and um calling out like when a student gets referred to sst because of that kind of flag of chronic absenteeism then there's like a process in place of who's talking to the student to be able to have that conversation and find out what's going on with the young person. And then from that, it needs to be kind of a menu of options, which you know we kind of call the tier two and the tier three supports to figure that out. I think what makes the data really messy in my mind compared to like when, when I was doing this seven years ago is the pandemic has created kind of a catch-all right now with the kids. So you've got some kids in there who are off track because of the pandemic back when they were ninth graders or they were seventh graders and they haven't caught up. So they're lagging with skill. And so it's a combination of things that's really going on for the kids in that situation versus, you know, other kids who might've stayed on track or near track during the pandemic. And then they hit the 11th grade. And then we see a typical pattern where job might be pulling, caretaking might be pulling. Um, and you get kind of a more traditional reason for why a student is in and out of school. I think the um, English language learners, like our MLE kids, um, that is a group that we need to have, um, and we've always needed to have better solutions for, for a number of reasons. I think the pandemic in particular, um, you know, really, really uh, hit at this group of students. And, and I also think that with the pattern we see often with our multilingual learners, particularly our newcomers, when they come in over aged and they're say 18 as a freshman and they know that they've got four years to go, they will often stay in school for a year or two. They'll, they'll start to learn English. They'll take advantage of the supports that are there at that moment, but then work ultimately and family responsibility ultimately pulls them out. And so just as recent as today, we talked about, you know, needing to develop a bridge program where they can start in the high school where they're rooted, be able to start with their ELL or with their ESL classes, get some of the basics for math and science for MCAS if they're gonna choose to ultimately stay in a traditional school setting, but have an option where they can go start in adult ed earlier if they're say 20, 21 years old, um, still be able to go for a diploma, but have a more flexible schedule have the ability to be able to work and not have it, you know, blow up their schedule. Um, that's a group that we really need to think out of the box about for solutions. So I think, you know, as we pull apart the dropout data, you know, which we have, um, we started with it, you know, today, we're going to be building up the um, tier two and tier three supports in our schools so that all of our kind of bigger open enrollment schools have some of the credit recovery and, um, alternative programming right in the school so the student doesn't need to leave it. Um, but then if a student is, you know, becomes overaged or it, you know, um, because of absenteeism starts to kind of get into that dropout cycle, we then have a menu of options for them that really speaks to where they are and what they need. So whether that's more academic recovery, whether that's social emotional support, whether that is um, you know, if they have an IEP, can do continuation of services, but really develop a menu that meets the young person where they are in that process. Um, that And have the ability that if that doesn't work out, they still can go back into the process and have another opportunity with another choice. So never giving up on them. Um, so I think, you know, th that's going to be something you're going to hear a lot more about. This is obviously very much about paying attention to data. I was on a call earlier today um, with superintendents from around the state. And um, this was like one of the big things that Desi was talking about was chronic absenteeism, you know, is part of the accountability mechanism, right? It's part of the accountability system. 
um, and just really saying, make sure you've got your system set up so you know who the students are um, and you're, you're able to support them. And I think, you know, what Brian's been able to show and Chief Kelton, um, you know, is, is, um, is building out is, is really a system that every school participates in, follows, um, but that relies also on working with the district in building out the levels of supports that young people need once they once we discover what the root or roots are as to why they're they're out, why they can't come to school regularly. You're 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 muted, Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Yeah, I was just saying it, there is a sort of terrifying element of the 16 plus number for our, our kids, right? Like we're almost at half of those young people are, are chronically absent. And just like in terms of skill development, and then obviously, I'm just like really curious what's pulling you, like what is keeping you from school? And to have harder data on that would be interesting. It actually is like full circle to the beginning of our our uh, conversation today yeah. during the superintendent report, right? Like yeah. that is just as important data for us to really formalize, to figure out around the sort of practices and the behaviors that young people are moving through that are yeah. keeping them from school. The yeah. second question I have is just around sort of school climate. And I know that there's the panorama data um, I don't think we've seen the data since after the pandemic, if I if I'm understanding it correctly. So is there a plan for that to keep happening, that, that school climate data to be released publicly and or even to be taken? Maybe it is being taken. I just don't know, um, because that I, I suspect will also help us understand schools that may be struggling around creating yeah. sort of engaging environment. So I, I believe April's on here. Um... Is Director Clarkson on here? Yeah, great, it is April. Uh, so just a question on the survey on the climate data, because we kind of capture this in several ways, um, but the timeline, like how often we're surveying um, and then when we would release that. Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. So uh, we have last year's climate survey online. If you go to bostonpublicschools.org slash survey, you'll be able to see last year's results for um, schools, teachers, and or sorry, students, teachers, and families on their school, and you can see that broken down for the district and then for each individual school by each question that's on the survey. Um, we suppress uh, low data, but for the most part, um, the student and the teacher rates are fairly high. So that data is available. Um, this year, we were able to administer an interim survey um, for schools that were interested in doing that. And they're able to track that through their regional PLCs to understand what engagement in climate looks like for students, staff, and families as well. We will be launching our spring survey next month. Um, the launch date is, um, we're hoping for April 10th, and that'll be open for about six weeks. Um, after that, we will um, analyze the data and we we aim to get the data um, analyzed and the results uh, posted to the website before the end of the school year um, so that schools are able to make plans and families are able to see um, the results of their surveys um, as soon as possible. Um, and so those will be up um, once they are available. Others? Mr. Mehta. Um, yeah, so um I I like I like what you guys are doing. Um but I just like to say ask um what steps are you taking proactively to um prevent well how do I explain this? How do I explain this? Uh not necessarily that but shoot how do what's how do I explain this um you know I will ask what steps are you taking proactively uh sure so I, I think um through sure I think I think you're asking 
what steps are we taking proactively when we see a student that has a chronic absenteeism issue um, forming, but maybe not is at that point? What's kind of the intervention steps that we take? So I think um, I think Brian, maybe we can talk about the SST process, and um, you know, and then the attendance plan and so forth. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of different um, levels to this. One is that we have historical attendance data of students who have been in the district, right? So part of what we coach schools to do is when we're going into the next school year, the time to start the outreach is early and often, right? And if you have capacity and opportunities to engage over the summer, that's critically important as well. And who can you really connect with the student from the school community that, that can do some of that consistent outreach. Hopefully it's based on an existing relationship, but if not, is it based on similar interests, background, a level of alignment? Some We have so many educators across schools that just have those personalities to engage students and really help students um, find that joy in coming to school every day and find that connection. As it relates to early warning indicators, Part of the process that we're helping each school build is that attendance team that's keeping an eye on the attendance data specifically and is doing some of the early outreach. And that has to happen in collaboration with the classroom teacher. That's part of the reason why the Panorama platform is, is so helpful because this, the teacher as well as folks from the attendance team who often overlap with the, the uh, student success team, the SST, and are part of the, the school student support team can work collaboratively to understand some of the root causes. What we coach and guide schools and help them implement in terms of a process is that the attendance team works closely and in conjunction with the SST so that once that root cause is identified, if it's not a matter of a deeper level of engagement, some of the relationship building, there are maybe some more complex challenges that a referral to the SST is made to help uh, better support that student with, again, tiered supports and a menu of options, as Superintendent Skipper mentioned. Okay, I remembered my question. I'm going to ask it. Um, let me just as in situations this is less attendance based but still attendance relevant adjacent in situations where a person may not graduate or is having or is in positions where they are forced to make up credits right which this happens all the time um like there is that conversation where the you have to make up the credit. I don't feel there's that real talk. This is one of what one of my friends said. There isn't that real talk. So Diego, are you talking about like um I'm just I wanna understand so I answer this right. Um are you talking so you're talking about like a a, a student that's at a school they're approaching, you know, they're not not uh, out of school necessarily. I'm saying you got to make up credit. So they've. I'm saying out. it's. A, no, I'm saying fail the class. Oh, failed the class. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I'm saying it's it's attendance adjacent because if you're missing school, you're more likely to fail the class. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think this gets into guidance, actually, right? Like where um, it's it's working with guidance so that we're we're really looking and auditing student transcripts closely and having conversations with students early so that if they're struggling and have failed a class, they know what their options are to be able to make it up before it becomes a real problem where they're like faced to repeat it, yeah. uh, repeat the entire grade or you know uh, go to summer. Um, is that that more what you're talking about? Yeah. I'm just saying that needs to happen because. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think us being very aware, you know, in our schools at the high school level in particular, 
of running, you know, regularly running reports and knowing, um, you know, where, where our students are academically and what they're missing for credit or where they're falling behind, right? Students could, would be referred to SST. Um, and I think the earlier intervention, the, the better, right? Um, that they're aware of it, their parents are aware of it so that they know what their options are rather than waiting until the end of the year and then discovering it um, and then having fewer options. So that's something we can give feedback, particularly to um, Catherine Chu and the guidance, uh, the guidance team in BPS. Okay. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Gracias, Madam Chair. Y gracias por uh, traer este reporte de la ausentismo crónico. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this report about the chronic absenteeism. Eh, es una preocupación que hemos estado hablando porque pienso que hay que descubrir la raíz de por qué está pasando ese ausentismo. I think that this, uh, this, there's a concern and that we have been talking about and, and we need to find the root causes of this chronic absenteeism. La escuela, a través de la trabajadora social eh, o de la encargada de familia y comunidad, debe hacer un, pienso que debe hacer un acercamiento más a las familias cuando esto esté pasando. The school should uh, through the social worker of the uh, family liaison should let, notify the family when this is happening. Y digo esto porque conocí un caso de una madre que estaba teniendo un embarazo de alto riesgo. And I'm mentioning this because I know of a case of a mother who had a, a high uh, risk pregnancy. Y tuvo que, la niña faltó por una semana y media a la escuela. So the girl missed a week and a half of school. Desafortunadamente, ella tuvo que enfrentar la corte por esto. Unfortunately, she had to go to court because ella, of this. Ella no tuvo la oportunidad de poder <coughs> tener el apoyo de la escuela para ver qué estaba pasando, cuál era la raíz del problema. She unfortunately didn't have the school support to get to the root of the problem. Entonces eso me hace pensar que nosotros, el distrito, debe tener un plan de seguimiento a las familias. ¿Por qué está pasando este ausentismo crónico? So this makes me think that the district should have a plan uh, to follow up what's happening with the families in these situations. Entonces, más que hacer una pregunta para mí es como una sugerencia de que, 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 que los líderes, que se hable con los líderes escolares, con los family liaison, con los social work, que necesitan esas familias porque están faltando, cuál es la causa que está originando esto antes de tomar una acción de mandar a una familia a una corte. So, this is not a question, but more of a suggestion to have the family liaisons or the social workers uh, in the schools to really uh, give a follow up with the families to find out what's happening before sending them to court. Esto va a marcar una diferencia en la vida de este estudiante. Because this is gonna mark a difference in the life of the student. Gracias. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Polanco Garcia. Um, without you know knowing the particulars of the situation, and, and obviously we wouldn't discuss that in this forum, um, we do have a process in place, but certainly that feedback is helpful because we want our whole vision around truancy court is that it should be the last resort. We require that schools have a documented tier three intervention plan and that all options and strategies have been exhausted before we have to get to that point. So ultimately, we understand the balance of our responsibility to make sure that students are in school every day and have every opportunity to be in school every day. But we want to help families overcome barriers, and that is our number one focus. 
um, I, I particularly appreciate um, your feedback and insight around um, social workers and family liaisons engaging. Um, that's something that we've seen really elevate as part of the regional model. We actually uh, recently introduced a specific um, guide for family liaisons that we've been training across regions that helps family liaisons to have some of those attendance conversations, but gives them a protocol in terms of prompts, in terms of how to pull the data, but how to approach the conversation in a way that is going to be student and family centered. And again, sharing the data transparently and trying to, to avoid that accusatory tone, right? Like trying to understand what the, the family is going through and helping to find common ground in terms of their hopes and dreams <clears throat> and what is happening with the, with the student's attendance and how that might impact the student down the road. But thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, um, thank you for the presentation this evening. And uh, it's nice to be back talking about student outcomes or more importantly, some of the key determinants of student outcomes. We know, I mean, it's such a direct correlation, right, on chronic absenteeism and the impact to our students. So I'm really glad that we're um, talking this through the data, you know, is important to see. We need to see it to understand the impact and um, appreciate the work that is being done and the range of items that are being done. It's it's interesting that Mr. Cardet Hernandez um, asked about a survey because I was going there right away <laughs> as well um, because it would really be interesting to hear the root causes from students' viewpoint. But I also know how difficult it is to really dig down and understand what someone may check. And then, you know, when you really talk. And I know the work we're doing around dropouts and the re-engagement center was groundbreaking when we brought in folks such as Emmanuel Allen, who is running it right now, Mr. Allen, and, and doing a great job. Um, and he was with a few other folks who really understood and could relate to the students because they had been there. That had been an issue to them mm -hmm. and they overcame it. And they could talk one-on-one -on -one with the students and relate. And I'm wondering how, you know, I hear these titles of attendance officer or that type of thing um, that you referenced. I think a, no, a, bit, a bunch of this comes down to mentoring and relating and having students understand the impact of, you know, not being absent, but also hearing them, that someone cares about them and, and wants them to be there and sees the value and can help model the behaviors, but also understanding that transportation, many of our students are going from one side of the city to another. And particularly in high school, they're on public transportation. And let's face it, I ride the orange line almost every day. I'm pretty tired of it crawling along. Right, and I can't imagine doing that at, at you know, 6.30 in the morning when you're a high schooler because we haven't adjusted the start times for high schools and, or maybe you are working two or three jobs and contributing to your family as well or caring for younger siblings as well, which is we know many of our older students are doing as well. So really understanding the root cause and trying to work with them on a solution, which is what I think we do so well at the re-engagement center and saying, getting to know a student saying, hey, maybe this school isn't the one, right one for you, but here are the options. And so I'm wondering how much mentoring fits in with what we're trying to do. And, and just one more comment, I have, I have mentioned in the past, have seen in other districts where they were working on the letters and taking that approach and delighted to see that we're now using these nudge letters. I was not aware we were doing that. So. Uh, kudos on that. Would love to see if we think that has had an impact as well, because I do know how that is based in science, that approach. And so uh, appreciate that. But um, I'm just wondering how how mentoring and and peer counseling and peer to peer counseling or, or engagement works in on this as well. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill. That's that's an excellent question. So um, it, it actually is one of the overarching themes that when we're uh, providing that on-site support to schools or we're guiding schools through the tiered attendant system process, there's a whole section about mentoring. And part of what we help schools to accomplish is to find areas where they can integrate mentoring principles in their school because there's a lot of different ways to go about it and depending on the grade ranges in a school it might look very different so um, you know the Tobin is an example they've been doing a student ambassador program for several years now where they pair older students with younger students particularly students that are having attendance challenges and there's a level of mentorship and coaching and it brings so much life and enrichment and engagement and connection to the school community um, our department is also very much involved with the ongoing leadership and uh, delivery of our academic mentorship program, which is a collaboration with the Division of Academics, as well as Equity Strategy and Opportunity Gaps. That is available to all students in grades 6 through 12. It's grown each year. That is a program that um, students ultimately opt in, and they share what's important to them and what their needs are and what they're looking for in a mentor. And then we have a really intensive matching process, and that's another area. So when, we, when we're working with schools, we help them to think about and explore what mentoring principles and programs they already have. Sometimes it can be family to family mentorship opportunities. It can be staff to student mentorship opportunities and then helping them to build that out and really run with that model, but also helping them to see that, hey, you can lean on the infrastructure that we already have in place. You can connect students to the existing mentorship programs. I know we also have a portfolio of um, peer to peer programs that we're gonna be looking to roll out um, in the next several months. So it's a huge focus of our work. We view relationships as the key to the solution and, and solving the challenge around chronic absenteeism and sense of belonging being the overarching theme. Yeah, I was, I'm gonna actually um, pull Chief Kelton in um, because I think it's important, I think as Brian's indicating, um, there's a whole menu of what we call kind of healthy youth development that we're working on. Um, you know, to build in. And so I think Chief Kelton's vision um, of the Department of Student Support and that being like a key piece uh, is worth just taking a minute to, to talk about. So Chief Kelton? Yeah, um, you know, I think what's really important in what we're trying to do in the Division of Student Support is recognize that relationship has to be at the core of any initiative, whether it's around attendance, um, whether it's around academics, students um, want to come someplace that they feel connected to, and they want to sit in a classroom and learn from a teacher that they feel connected to. So as we begin to sort of create more engagement opportunities for our young people to um, offset this chronic absenteeism, we are understanding that at the core of all of this programming has to be, it has to be relational. It has to be a program that connects our young people, not only to one another, but also to the adults. Um, I recently hired an assistant super of, a superintendent of student development and advancement, Corey McCarthy, and he is helping to support the Department of Opportunity Youth. And um, he is starting to roll out a peer mediation program district-wide. Um, it's a peer diplomat program. Um, and we're also looking at expanding our anti-bullying ambassadors program um, and also partnering with the mayor's office of black male advancement to expand beyond academic mentorship um, into relational mentorship. Um, so students have the opportunity to engage with um, and create and learn how to create meaningful relationships with adults. Um, so, you know, I think while we do this, we also can't lose sight of the fact that it's imperative that we create connection with families as well, um, that parents are a part of this, because um, to the exact point of Ms. Polanco Garcia, we have to know that we can pick up the phone and connect 
with an adult or with a parent when we see a student is starting to slip. Um, so I think that is really sort of the driving force right now in the division of student support is creating opportunities um, with community partners and also in school that build upon um, creating healthy and meaningful relationships with our young people between one another and between adults. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I'll just say in conclusion, um, after what you've said, and I appreciate that there is a, a lot of focus on mentorship. It'd be interesting as we talked about, you know, having data from a survey of students of why they say, you know, what this is. It would also be interesting to hear from the mentors, the ones who are working directly with the students, of what their interpretation of the root cause is and see if there's a disconnect between the two. And um, that may be helpful as well. Um, so to, just a thought, but I, I appreciate yeah. the focus on this. This is such a important, you know, leading indicator towards overall student achievement. Thank you. I know we've a lot of questions have been about um, the older students. I'm wondering when you were talking about the statistics that we have a number of very young students or families who are, you know, and who are more responsible for getting kids to school and not getting them there and what strategies we're looking at around parent engagement or parent and actually in some ways parent learning about the importance of consistent starting the habit of consistent school attendance very young. <clears throat> yeah, Superintendent Skipper, I don't know if you want to jump in on yeah, that. Yeah, one. I will. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I, so my, my thought on this chair is that, uh, chair, is that um, really this is where the social workers are, like are so critical in the schools. Because mm -hmm. generally when a parent is struggling getting a student to school, it's a family systems piece. And we, you know, we have to work across the family and we have to identify, you know, what, are the, what, how can we help stabilize what's um, agencies that we can help connect the parent to. Um, and so I, to me, that's where the social workers are just, it, it's a non-negotiable at this point. Like there has to be social workers in our schools, um, you know, as many as we can. Uh, bilingual social workers are extremely important so that communication isn't a further barrier. Um, and just making that connection with the family unit, leveraging our city agencies and knowing what they are, leveraging our community-based agencies and what's in the community and making that connection. It's what actually really excites me about the hub model with our community schools because we can see a day in BPS where <clears throat> All of that is right there where the student's living and where the, where the family's living, as opposed to having to kind of go across town uh, or the city to get those resources. So, um, uh, you know, we're working really closely with our social workers, with our school psychologists and clinicians, like everyone in that fabric um, to make the connection for our youngest students where we, we see that that. And sometimes it can be transportation, it can be um, a resource issue for them, it can be a caretaker issue for them, um, it can be a lot of different things, but the only way we solve those is, uh, you know, and those are the ones we really worry about um, because the student is often so young that they themselves aren't an agent in it. Um, so, but we, we have a lot of systems mm -hmm. in, in, at this point to identify. Yeah, it, it's wonderful having the support of all the extras, but what are we doing to help classroom teachers, particularly, to become yeah. more in tune with families, you know, more family engagement, those kinds of things yeah. as well? Yeah, this is why in the budget, um, we we led with MTSS as a tier one strategy, because it is through the MTSS model that we're really talking about multiple tiered supports. And the classroom teacher is a part of that. So really having strong academic, a strong PD and training for our teachers because they see our students every day and they're meeting our families every day. Um, so as that starts to strengthen in our district and we actually really have common language and strategy um, through MTSS with the training that's gonna be run through Dr. Chen's office, um, that's going to help us to really be able to even uh, to identify students that we weren't previously, um, but more importantly, to put a support in place for those students um, in, in a tier one and kind of a universal. Um, the other work is 
you know, in the regional network model, now that we have the, and we have family liaisons in each of the schools, this is the other deep training that those family engagement um, specialists receive and will get, which is how to be able to have those conversations and where to tap resources um, when a family unit is struggling and it expresses itself um, in attendance. And that's what I think, you know, Brian was sort of referring to is it's really using the support system that we have at the school that's comprised of a lot of these um, different uh, support staff, but along with the classroom teacher to be able to make sure that our youngest students in particular are cared for and, um, and noticed when something's going awry. Yeah, I think early in the presentation, you were, you were doing a correlation that was talking about that. Um, there were a number of, you know, chronic abs absenteeism in many of our um, schools that are, you know, in turnaround or, you know, that are needing more, you know, more supports. And I guess the question is, again, around family engagement and family awareness around that, you know, kids do better when they're in school and um, yeah. the family routines and all of those kinds of things. And wondering if, you know, if there's any other kinds of messaging that we need to do that helps parents to, to see the relationship also between student outcomes and student attendance and routines early on to prevent, you know, later school yeah. issues. Yeah, these are the, I mean, these are the real conversations, right? When teachers, you know, have that conversation at a parent conference, um, you know, or at a curriculum night and make that connection for the parent that, you know, here's what students are learning. And when your student's not here, they're missing this. And in fact, not only are they missing this, but then yeah. when they come back, it's very hard for them to understand true. all we did yesterday, right? And so it really is, I mean, I once had a principal that literally calculated like minute, the instructional minutes that a student would miss. And it was amazing that one simple thing that then was able to translate that to our pa to parents. And the attendance went way up because parents weren't thinking about one day. They were thinking about six and a half hours of instruction times, you know, 300 minutes of instruction, right? And so all of a sudden it just took on a very different sense of importance as opposed to, well, if they miss a day, they miss a day. Um, you know, type of thing. So I think you're absolutely right. That dialogue is key. The education piece is key. Um, you know, to Ms. Blanco Garcia's point, the, con the connection with our families at the yeah. earliest possible moment, um, you know, is, is critical to engaging the parent to be part of the solution. Yeah, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Are there any other comments before we move on? If not, I wanna thank you, Mr. Marks, um, for the report and we um, look forward to next steps in hearing more about this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Sure. All right. We'll now move on to public comment on reports, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers for public comment on reports. All righty, thank you. Is there any new business? not that concludes our business for this evening um the next virtual school committee meeting will take place on wednesday april 12th at 5 p.m if there's nothing further i'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting so is there a motion so moved thank you is there a second second, second. thank you Ms. <laughs> sullivan will you please call the roll thank you Dr. Alkins, Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Yes. Ms. Lopera, Ms. Polanco Garcia. Gracias y buenas noches. Yes. Mr. Tran. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Robinson. Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you and good evening. Okay. Have a good evening. Good night, all. Good night, everyone.